There we go. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here to speak. My name is Tim Bauman. I live at 1308 35th Avenue Southwest. Um, and I'm speaking here today as a member of a group called the Minot Environmental Policy Group. Uh, you may remember we did speak in front of this council in November. No recommendations today. Um, so it should just be talking about a project that we are working on. Um, and that project is the introduction of the Sustainable Minot Initiative. No um, and what Sustainable Minot is, is essentially a score sheet uh, that we put together to reward and encourage actions in sustainability, environmental sustainability in our community. The broad categories cover topics like waste, um, electricity usage, water usage, home design and landscaping, food and diet, and transportation, and other community building events. Um, two other members of the group are here with me today, Monica Peterson and Shannon Kruger. Um, we'd be available to answer any questions if you have anything. Uh, I did send a link to the online version of the Sustainable Minot survey or score sheet to you. Um, also wanted to just publicly say and, and acknowledge we have run this by Tom Berry, the city manager, the assistant public works director, Jason Sorensen, and Tom Rafferty from Verendry Electric, Electric, just to make sure that um, none of the actions that we recommend on the score sheet go against good safety practices or common practices or um, just forward motion and the way that the city and our community operates. Um, and we got the okay from all of them. And um, again, just kind of in summary, we know that some of the items on the score sheet are pretty cosmetic and things that you know may uh, just avoid unnecessary trash, things like turning off lights, things like removing extra weight from the back of your car for extra or better mileage. Um, but there are several items within the score sheet that are a little bit longer reaching and kind of think the long picture for the way our community operates, such as pledging to um, uh, upgrade appliances and light bulbs and vehicles to more energy efficient models, things that create um, long term trajectory for the way our community operates. Um, and so we just wanted to uh, let you know about this initiative. It's happening in our community. It launched today and um, we wanted to be available to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you. Are there any questions from Mr. Bowman? Alderman Padragula. Thank you, ma'am. Um, just a couple of comments. First of all, uh, and I'm going to be reading through the, the detailed proposal. Um, first of all, I'm really impressed that you and a group of citizens has gotten together and tried to make us more sensitive and conscious about environmental kinds of issues. I think it's really important that we have this kind of a grassroots effort. Uh, and I, I really commend you on that. Uh, hopefully this will prod us to uh, be more conscious about those things ourselves here on the council. But certainly if we can get the public more uh, concerned and involved in whatever ways they feel comfortable. And one of the things I've learned from looking at your materials is you don't do everything. If there's certain things you're not into doing, that's okay. But if you can do other things, that's okay too. Um, this kind of was brought home to me when I was out of town, and I apologize I'm a little bit winded, but I was <laughs> supposed to get back at, at midnight last night and get back till noon today um, because of flight issues. Um, one of the things I did is I went shopping with some people, and they stopped at a coffee bar and in a grocery store. And one of the things the coffee bar had was paper straws. This is the first time I've ever used a paper straw. And it was okay. Nothing bad happened. And <laughs> nothing bad is going to happen to the seal or whoever ultimately might eat the straw straw if we're plastic end up in the ocean. So I really commend you for this. I think it's going to take a lot of small changes by a lot of people over probably a long time to get us in a better place. Second comment is somewhat critical in the sense that you said you'd gotten permission from the city, from city staff. I'm very much impressed and very pleased that you went to city staff and coordinated with them and, and flew this by them so there'd be no misunderstandings, no policy conflicts or anything like that. But here's the critical part. I don't think citizens should have to go to the city to ask for permission to organize and do things. I think citizens should have the freedom and do have the freedom to organize on their own. So I applaud your willingness and desire to work with the city. I think that's best for everyone and very good. But I really um, am uncomfortable with the idea of citizens seeking permission from the city to do something in a lawful kind of fashion. So thanks and good luck. Thank you. Alderman Street. I'm going to start it off. Mayor Olson, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bauman, I would encourage you tomorrow night uh, at 630 is the Minot Park District uh, public meeting and maybe take that to them. I know there's a discussion of bringing back a trails committee um, just because I, as I was scrolling down part of the uh, 
the Survey Monkey, there's uh, elements about biking and walking and carpooling, and um, I think it would be important as some of the things change in the community. Obviously, we're talking about flood control, but we're also trying to talk about this balance of trying to have better recreation access, and uh, I think it would be important if you could kind of work with them and bring them on board just to what you're trying to do, and then you can share information back to other larger citizens of initiatives that are happening. So I commend you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Olson. <clears throat> Tim, I appreciate all the information. I appreciate the collaboration. Maybe maybe to piggyback off of Alderman uh, Padragula's comments, I never saw it as maybe permission to, to, okay. to, to, but maybe a collaborative effort because that's how we are truly going to make steps forward is to, to work together and uh, not maybe necessarily pull in so many different directions. So I appreciate you collaborating with, with the, the city. Um, the, the one thing that came to me with obviously having small children, that's that's where it starts is the next generation. I, I don't want to say that I can't change my ways, but we all know the saying, the old adage, it's hard to uh, teach a new dog, old dog new tricks. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd encourage to get into the school systems with the school boards, extra credit projects to take home and if they can do. And, and that that's where I would see it. I mean, I remember bringing things home like, like that with as a kid to for extra credit or to become aware or, or to go on a scavenger hunt with your parents to learn these things and do a report on them. I, I, that, that would, that's where my mind goes just to to lend my two cents to it. But again, I appreciate the information. I appreciate the effort and the work you guys are doing. Thank you. Alderman Walski. Mayor Olson, thank you. Uh, echo all of those things. Uh, Tim, to speak uh, to a, a past project, just to uh, say thanks for that as well. Um, your group organized uh, an enormous volunteer effort into our grocery stores last month, or maybe that was this month. I'm getting confused. <laughs> last month. Last month. Um, was it 9,000 bags, uh, reusable bags that were uh, donated and then distributed. Um, I, I, I volunteered for, for a couple sessions. I saw a lot of very appreciative faces, uh, folks who uh, identify with this effort and they want to do better. One of the comments that came back from that process repeatedly was, um, I always forget my bags, or I forgot them in my car, or I, I can't get them out of the house into the car. So um, I'm using this opportunity to simply uh, Call, a, call attention to this particular challenge that we all have in terms of remembering our reu reusable bags at these critical moments. Um, maybe as a p potential future project, you guys can continue to work with the grocery stores to get some reminders out in the parking lots and some signs on doors and things like that to, to try and sort of help people be a, a little better stewards because I think we all want to be there, but sometimes we're just not as thoughtful as we wish we are, or we get in hurries and all these little things sort of get in the way of, of doing a little better. So thank you guys for, for all of your efforts. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, one last comment I, I forgot. Uh, the Survey Monkey version of the score sheet is available through the Environmentally Minded People of Minot Facebook page. There will also be an analog paper copy available at the Minot Public Library in the coming days. Thank you. I did take the survey, and, and thank you for sending it. It was eye-opening. I appreciated it. There were, as you no noted, certainly things that everyone knows, but then other items that not everyone thinks about. So I would encourage everyone to take the survey. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to come forward for personal appearances? Hi. Hi, good evening. Please uh, state your name and address, please. Uh, Kaylin DeWitt Vidal. My address is 1210 9th Street Northwest. Uh, I came here to talk to you guys about recycling again. Okay. I've been up here a couple times. Um, I'm finally recovering from a tonsillectomy I had, so I missed a couple of meetings talking to you guys. Um, today, I have a short letter that I want to read to you that someone sent to me and asked if I could read it because she didn't want to get up here and talk because it's kind of nerve-wracking. Certainly, go ahead. Um, her name is Kelsey Buchholz. She lives at 1790 11th Street Southeast, uh, Unit C. Uh, she is, she says, I'm originally from Canada. Recycling is second nature. You aren't even really aware of it. It's just something that you're always taught to do. When I came to Minot to attend MSU, I was happy to see some recycling on campus, but I was very aware of the lack of sustainability around the rest of town. My husband and I moved to Grand Forks for med school, and we are so happy to have, we were so happy to have easily accessible recycling and close drop-off spots. When we had to come back to Minot for my husband's clerkship years, we were honestly disappointed that we were coming back to a non-recycling city. And it makes you even more aware of how much you are wasting when you are used to recycling. 
we would happily pay for curbside recycling and the convenience that comes with it. With curbside recycling, it would become second nature for many and only benefit our sustainable efforts. Minot is known around the state for its lack of recycling efforts, and I would be proud to live in the city if we were able to take this huge step forward towards a greener Minot. So this is coming from a young adult, and um, I think you guys should seriously consider not only the young adults, but the teens and kids that do live here. Um, if you wanna make our city an appealing place for those younger, younger generations to live, then I think recycling is gonna have to be a, a very serious consideration. Uh, I'm constantly hearing young people complaining that Minot is not progressive, and pretty much all of my friends have moved out of state because of this, or at very least to Fargo. I have a couple that live in Fargo. Um, I understand why they move away, uh, but I personally want to stay here, and I'm up here talking to you guys in hopes that I can help to make this community better rather than leaving it for a more progressive area. Uh, as a city, we should be investing in youth priorities, and we need to make sure that our community attracts those young people and make sure that they know that their ideas and opinions matter. If you don't take these issue, issues seriously, we could very well be losing our young people to other communities. So just like Paul was saying earlier about teaching kids in school like why they should be recycling, and you know, I've brought up before that my daughter's five and at least once a week, I look up and whatever she's watching is teaching her about recycling and sustainability. So, you know, we know that we have to keep our young people in the city. Like, we can't keep going without either attracting young people or keeping the young people here. And I think it's going to be important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions? None? All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else that would like to come forward for personal appearances? Seeing none, we'll move on to item number four, which is a public hearing. A public hearing to allow Rocky McCain, an applicant for a taxi license, to appeal the decision made by the police chief to deny the application based on the qualifications and background examination. It's recommended the city council ratify the decision made by the police chief to deny a city of Minot taxi license to Rocky McCain based on a review of his driving records. Is Mr. McCain here? Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak to this? Anyone that would like to speak to this? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. Mayor Olson. Yes. I'd move we close uh, the public hearing and affirm the police chief's decision to deny this taxi license. Second. Any discussion? Any discussion? Call the roll. Wolski. Yes. Olson. Yes. Pittner. Yes. Padragula? Yes. Straight? Yes. Item number five is um, considering the report of the Magic Fund Screening Committee. Hmm? Oh, <laughs> 5.1. All right. Um, that would be a public hearing to approve the Magic Fund Service Basin Council Agreement. The Sarah Space and Planning Council submitted a Magic Fund grant application to the Magic Fund Screening Committee to capitalize a new revolving loan fund specifically designed to work in conjunction with the Bank of North Dakota PACE and Flex PACE interest rate buy-down programs. The funds requested by this council is $500,000 in 2019 and $500,000 in 2020. The Magic Fund Screening Committee at its April 26, 2019 meeting approved the request. Is there a motion? Mayor Olson. Alderman Strait. I'd move the agenda item. Second. Okay. Um, yes. Well, are, are we yeah. still in our public hearing? Yes, we are. I, I thought. Is it appropriate? I probably took it in the wrong order, okay. so I will call okay. people forward, and then we should we rescind the motion? Yes. All right. Yeah. Mayor Olson, I would. My apologies. I would close the public hearing and move the agenda item. We haven't had a public it's hearing. Yet. Oh. What? Sorry. You rescind your motion. I rescind my motion. All right. My apologies. Agree? Agrees. All right. We'll get it straight here. <laughs> Maybe. Probably not. All right. Is there anyone that would like to speak to this item? If there is, please come forward. And your name and address for the record, please. Good evening. Uh, my name is Lindsay Ulrichsen. My address is 1630th Street, Northwest Minot. All right. Go ahead. 
Um, first, I just wanted to congratulate um, Vice President Olson for being the first female to preside over a Minot City Council meeting tonight, um, making history. So I wanted to address that. Um, I, I've, I've talked to, to many of you about this already. Um, uh, for anyone who isn't that familiar with Service Space, and we've been around since the 70s, uh, we were born out of the Century Code um, with seven other regional councils in the state. And um, we've been doing lending for probably 22 to 23 years as an organization. Um, we have right now a $1.7 million loan portfolio. Um, we started with about um, with about 500,000 um, probably 22 years ago and another 500,000 15 years ago and, and we've revolved that um, y you know into five million dollars worth of worth of loans. Um, and so we have we have a lot of experience with this. Um, this program is is really important to us. It will allow us to capitalize on Bank of North Dakota programs that right now it's really difficult for us to do that in Minot and in the surrounding area because there isn't really um, a community match source that's required by Bank of North Dakota. Um, and so that's, you know, we've been talking a lot over the last uh, 12 to 15 months um, in Minot and in the region. We just um, completed our five-year strategic plan in December of 2018 and all of our public input meetings, um, there, the need was identified that we don't have local match for Bank of North Dakota projects. So, uh, or for, I'm sorry, for the, the PACE and Flex PACE programs. So we, we thought, you know, this is something we already do. We already have software. We already have plans and, and processes in place for this. So we can, we can do this if, if we just had the money to do it. So um, we really appreciate the opportunity to apply for these funds. Uh, we think that it's really going to help drive private investment, um, not only in Minot, but in our seven county region. Um, and so I, you know, I would entertain any questions that anyone has um, about the application or about the program, um, comments. Any questions for Ms. Orlikston? Alderman Walski. Mayor Olson, I have a couple here. Um, first, Lindsay, thank you for the application. I think uh, over the, the past uh, year or, or longer, we've been going through this uh, review of our economic development practices. I think um, the, the use of these tools that are available to us has been identified as something we should pursue. Um, and I think I'm also uh, supportive of creating some tools that uh, that are there for small businesses, that are there for local businesses that aren't, they don't, to, to traditionally qualify for um, what have been our our ongoing economic de development tools and practices in the past. So I think this is a, this program is largely a good fit. Um, one first question, uh, just to, to confirm, you guys are already operating a, a, s a small business revolving loan fund for us, or are just getting one off the ground? Is that correct? Uh, correct. So for the, are you referring to the revolving loan fund that came out of the NDR funds? Yes, the, or I think it was the, the first or second allocation, maybe not the NDR, but it, okay. it had dollars. Yep, yep. So we are working um, with, with city staff to develop the program policies and guidelines. Um, we're awaiting um, nonprofit status for the organization that's being created who would oversee those those dollars. Um, so we have, I think we're in probably our, our fourth or fifth draft of, of the policy guidelines and um, we're, we're just waiting on that, that status. We'll be putting all of the, the paperwork uh, you know, loan closing documents and um, security agreements and all of those things together for uh, city review and, and adoption. Okay, Mayor, if I, yes. um, I, I appreciate hearing that. I think there's some, uh, some, some common sense that goes with sort of considering these types of programs and making sure that, that a lot of these things are living sort of under the same umbrella or the same organiza organization. Um, probably more for, or as much for the folks listening uh, online who maybe aren't here, but but also for myself, because I think sometimes the, the nature of these particular programs isn't easily understood. So would you be able to just sort of walk us through maybe a, a, a simple example of how this particular program works, how it, uh, uh, sort of a concrete sense of a small business going through a process, what this delivers for them. Sure, sure. So um, generally we would be approached by either the borrower 
um, their lead lender or the Bank of North Dakota about a project. Any, any one of those organizations could reach out to us um, if we had this program available. We would then coordinate with all of those, with you know, essentially f a, a minimum of four entities: the the lead lender, the borrower, uh, Bank of North Dakota, and our organization. Um, and we would coordinate eligibility. Um, you know, can we can we do we all have the available funds? Does this is this approved? You know, or or, or is it eligible for all of these funding sources? So we would coordinate that. Um, if, if they would be eligible for, for all of the programs, we would then move into a coordinated effort with Bank of North Dakota and the lead lender um, and any other additional funding partners that are, are a part of this. We've, we've had projects where we've been um, a partner to you know, five other organizations on, on one single project. So there could be, there could be multiple um, additional parties to this as well. Um, and so once we determine that a, a project would be eligible, we then um, go through the application process. So for us, um, we always try to keep it as easy as possible for that end user. So we help them put that application together. We use um, whatever the bank and Bank of North Dakota already has. So that borrower or potential borrower isn't providing that over and over and over and filling out all of that additional paperwork. Um, so we assist with that. Um, Typically, it's a it's a coordinated effort to get all of the entities to kind of approve at, at their level, um, pretty close to to one another. We we don't all approve it on the same day, but um, typically, if we approve something, it's pending approval by Bank of North Dakota or vice versa. Um, as long as everyone else gets through their approval process, it's it's a go. Um, with that, once once it's a go, we we coordinate. Um, collateral and security, um, you know, what are the terms of each loan going to be, what are the rates going to be, we coordinate that with all of the entities. Um, and then um, once everything goes through the application process and it gets approved, we enter into an intercreditor agreement with all of the lending partners. Um, we do that internally with our own agreement. Um, it really just outlines what everyone, what everyone has agreed to. It's a, a shared agreement, a shared understanding of um, this is how everyone understands this process to go. This is the collateral you're receiving. This is the, the terms and the rates that all of the entities are providing. Um, and then we also enter into a contract with um, the Bank of North Dakota and the other entities also enter into those agreements as well with, with them. Um, and so once it kind of goes in, I'll, sorry, I'll, I could get really lengthy about this. I can get really nerdy about talking about this. So um, once it once it's ready yeah, to... I, mostly I'm curious about from a borrower standpoint. Sure. So the, the small business that's coming to you, what are you guys able to provide to them and what is the advantage for this particular program? Sure, sure. Okay. So as far as assisting with the application and coordinating with everyone, um, we then, the, the Bank of North Dakota program will buy down um, interest for the borrower. So if, if a borrower has a, a loan with a lead lender of $100,000 at 6% interest, um, this Bank of North Dakota program can buy down that interest rate for, for a certain period of years um, all the way down to 1% interest. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's a really, really great program um, for any new business that's starting out. That's, that's really, really helpful. So with the Bank of North Dakota program, they require that there's a, a percentage of community match. So in Minot, um, Bank of North Dakota will provide 65% of the buy-down, and the community needs to provide 35% of, of the buy-down. So that's where this program would come in, provide that 35% buy-down. Um, up to $70,000 is, is what we've included in, the, in our policy guidelines, um, and we would buy down um, no more than a, a period of three years. Okay. Further questions? Alderman Strait. Uh, thank you, Mayor Olson. Um, <clears throat> Lindsay, give us a sense of the, the return on investment then for those, uh, that type of buy-down. Sure. So um, we have, have calculated that at a minimum for every dollar that we lend out, we will get another $6 back into the community with private investment, um, Bank of North Dakota funds and, and any other any of our lending partners that are involved in that. Um, that's uh, that that's on the small end. We we you know that's the minimum we think we'll leverage with this. 
continue. Uh, continuation. Thank you, Mayor Olson. Uh, Lindsay, speak to maybe the, um, some of the businesses that this would be appealing towards as, as a kind of the lay of the land. Uh, I recognize you have to pr kind of protect confidentiality, but businesses, sectors that might jump right in. Sure. Um, we really see right now, uh, the needs are going to change in the future, but right now we see this as a need for um, real estate developers, um, people coming in and, you know, renovating old buildings. Um, there's, a, there's a big resurgence of that, you know, that with the Main Street Initiative, and um, everyone's really excited about um, redoing these main streets. And so um, we see that in Minot and with our, in our rural communities as well. Um, so uh, new business development, um, any, any, any business that's coming in and, and building a brand new building for their operations or any existing business that wants to expand their operations, um, you know, uh, which, what kind of sectors would be, would we be looking at? You know, that's, um, we, we don't know. It's, it's, What's exciting about it is it's it's kind of different all the time, so it's it's fun to be a part of that. But um, you know, in our rural areas, grocery stores are really really important. So you know, maybe new businesses, new new people coming in and purchasing grocery stores or starting grocery stores um, might be one example. Any further questions? Alderman Pitner. Thank you, Marilson. Lindsay, just um, you guys obviously serve service Minot, but also the region. What percentage of the loans you guys would administer would be local versus regional? Just give me a sense of that. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, are you asking about our existing loan portfolio or what we will do with this? With this. Okay. So with this, we, we have it in our policy guidelines that 70% of the magic fund dollars will be lent within the city limits of Minot. Perfect. At a minimum. That was my question. And just a continuation on that thought. Like I say, these are magic fund dollars. These are sales tax dollars. These are outside communities coming into our community, purchasing sales tax for this purpose. Um, just wanted to kind of point that. There was, I know there's been some con, kind of some hesitation with maybe outside areas. Like I say, outside areas are contributing to this, to this, uh, this fund. So just wanted to put that out there. Any further questions? Alderman Pachagula. Yes, Madam Acting Mayor. I have a series of kind of rapid fire questions to try to make sure I understand this correctly. Yeah. First of all, is it correct that you guys are pros at doing this? I would say it is correct. Yeah, sure. So you've been doing this for many years. Yes. You've made loans for millions of dollars. Yes. To numerous entities. You partner with other organizations. Yes. 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 <laughs> you carefully vet these proposals. Yes. You are accountable and transparent in giving these loans or, or coordinating the uh, giving, uh, making, not giving, it's not, it's not giving, it's making of these loans, right? Yes. Okay. And you write herd on them carefully. I'm sorry? To make sure that the loans are paid in, back in a timely manner. Yes. And... Um, these loans would primarily be spent in the city, but to a significant extent within the broader trade area of Minot. That's correct. And you want to be as, make things as easy as possible, make as few hoops as possible for people to jump through, particularly small and or new businesses. That's correct. And you would not overlap or duplicate with the work of the Magic Fund. You would complement their work and the work of the Bank of North Dakota and private lenders too. That's correct. That's correct? Thanks. Any further questions? All right. Thank I've been you. hanging around with a lot of lawyers this past week. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to this item? Anyone else? Seeing none, now I would entertain a motion. <clears throat> Mayor, I would so move to close the public hearing and uh, approve the item. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Any discussion? Alderman Walski? Sure. Um, thank you, Mayor Olson. Uh, just a, a couple comments here. Uh, this is uh, kind of a first crack at a, at a magic fund application since we've gone through some uh, revisions to our guidelines there. Um, I, I know we have some applicants who are feeling out that process. We have some city staff that's feeling out that process. Um, I would encourage all of us to uh, uh, 
share feedback as we get through this. Um, I, I doubt that these particular policies and procedures that we've put in place are perfect. Uh, everything can always be improved upon. And, uh, and so I think maybe there's, it's appropriate to do just a little bit of uh, light after action on this one to, uh, to establish uh, if there's opportunities to address any of those issues. Um, uh, and, and that's kind of it. I, I think Alderman Strait, uh, uh, my expectation is uh, you've got a draft amendment potentially to the, to the contract. I'll let you handle that if the mayor so approves. Yes, Alderman Strait. Uh, thank you, Mayor Olson. First and foremost, I, uh, I thank you and, and our city manager, Mr. Lakefield. I want to recognize you today as the city manager for uh, getting this on the agenda because I was out of it. I was adamantly uh, for 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 having this move forward because it's um, it's been in the works. Uh, our partners that are in the audience have uh, waited patiently. Um, and to to Mr. Hertz's comment from the Magic Fund Steering Committee, this particular program is long overdue. Um, I think we're all going to support it tonight. Uh, but it, it and for that reason, it's a, it's a very exciting time. I'm I'm excited by it, but I have to admit that there's. There's been frustration that's played out to Alderman Walski's point where I think we could be a little reflective uh, over the next few weeks to iron out some of these differences uh, to make it better for our partners moving forward. Uh, I, I want to commend uh, not just you, Ma Mayor Olson, but um, Mr. Lakefield and, and Kelly H. Uh, you, you as our city staff provide the guidance that we need. You advise us on these things, but this is one of the matters where the city of Minot and the city council we get to lead and we get to decide, and it matters. It, ma it matters tonight in the message that we are ultimately gonna send through this, that we are aware of what's happening. And for that reason, I, I would like to amend the uh, Suris Basin uh, contract agreement, and I've provided each of you the language that's in front of you now. And I, I didn't want to uh, put a dollar amount on it because this has uh, been a, a, a discussion back and forth, but. At this time, I'm going to I'm going to add a, an initial discussion point of two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. That is for the uh, the funding advance described above, provided for the grantee um, that would go to Suris Basin to do the work. Uh, I think it's important that we've heard and we're going to hear the advice from uh, City Manager Lakefield. These are magic fund dollars, but these are our dollars as well. And I think it's important, it sends a strong message to the Bank of North Dakota and to our partners that we trust our partner and that we are gonna get out of our own way and let them do the work. And uh, with that, that is my motion, ma'am. And uh, I would uh, stand for questions if I can get a second. I'll second. Um, I, I think for the public's benefit, it would be good if you would read your amendment so that sure. they're aware of what we are considering here? Uh, my amendment would be that the uh, City Council adopt uh, amended language to Section F uh, under Agenda 5.1 that reads, would you like me to read the entire language? Please. Yes. Yep. The, uh, Section E, grant payment. After execution of this agreement, the City of Minot will advance $250,000 to the grantee, which shall be expended for the purpose described in the grant application within three business days of expending any portion of the advance funding referenced in the preceding sentence. The grantee shall provide documentation establishing that the expenditure was in accordance with the grant application and the grant program and approved by the appropriate entities prior to expenditure. It's F, sorry, not E, F. All right. Thank you. Questions on Alderman Pajagula? I'm not sure I understand this, although I've been hanging out with some attorneys. I haven't kind of taken in their um, analytic sure. bent. Um, is this to, you know, I thought originally we were going to give uh, $500,000 per year for two years to establish this revolving loan fund. And I'm not quite sure what the 250000 in the three days is. Is that saying that of, of the first 550000 we're going to give it to them within three days or what? Uh, Alderman Street. City, I'm going to look to City Manager right. Lakefield yeah. just for the clarity of, of why this was exactly uh, 
change from the initial $500,000 that came out of the steering committee to, to this point now where I'm recommending the $250,000 uh, transfer. Madam Mayor, members of the council, um, the concern that we had with this agreement when we were looking at it with the contract uh, committee was that typically, and I don't know that we have ever funded a magic fund project where we have advance funded the project. Typically, the entity would be reimbursed for expenses um, after the fact. This is a little bit of a unique circumstance um, here where they have to have the funding in place to be able to uh, grant the loans and move forward with the loan closing. So the, doc, uh, the process that we outlined in the original contract uh, was that the Sir Space and Planning Council would provide uh, documentation that the loans have been approved uh, through their process that's outlined in, in the document and that City of Minot would fund, uh, provide that funding to them within five business days in the agreement. Um, so in other words, they would have a loan already set uh, that's approved or uh, ready to close and we would send them the funding in time for them to, to fund the loan and close on it, but we wouldn't send them an, an amount um, in advance of having that loan ready to go. We would keep that money in the magic fund until that loan is approved and ready to go. So if I'll I could ask Mr. Lakefield to clarify, <coughs> are we still giving them 500,000 a year? Uh, Madam Mayor and Alderman Padragula, that would be the intent of the language and that is included in section A, that it would be up to $500,000 for the first uh -huh. year and the second year, the funding is uh, contingent upon, uh, you know, the balance in the magic fund at the beginning right. of the year, and, as well as some other items such as, you know, pending uh, magic fund applications and availability of funding and uh, subsequent approval for the, the second round of funding by the city council. I'm, st I'm, st I'm not very good with my, I'm still unclear about this. So are, are we in a sense giving them this money prior to any specific use they would have for it, kind of to set them up. Madam Mayor and Alderman Padragula, uh, under the, the contract as it is originally uh, presented here, the authorization is there for the funding, but we would not send that money to them until they had um, a loan that was approved and ready to close. With Alderman uh, Strait's amendment, um, that would in essence, we would send some of that funding to them within three days prior to having any loans that are ready to close. So in other words, they would deposit that money in their account and um, it would sit there until the project comes up. Comes up. Alderman Street. M Madam Mayor, uh, Mr. Potter-Gula, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that in city staff, Mr. Lakefield, they're doing their job. However, um, there, there's an added redundancy. You heard clearly from Ms. Ulrichson that this program is gonna be vetted. The dollars that are going into this program that the steering committee has approved should go into the program and we should allow it to run. We shouldn't have the extra layer from the city of re having to just um, uh, re-vet we, we trust our partner, Cirrus Basin, has stepped up. This is the IEDC report recommendation. They've made it through the steering committee recommendation from the Magic Fund. The dollars are there. I think it sends the message. What I'm trying to convey is that we trust our partners. The money is going to go into a revolving loan fund and come back into the revolving loan fund. I'm also trying to ultimately protect city staff that we spend a lot of time defending in the public that um, I think we have to trust the Magic Fund Steering Committee here and back off, trust them, fund Cirrus Basin, and get out of the way because we add too many additional layers. There's frustration, there's process that as much as we want to be flexible, uh, we're not great at it. And so the, the point being that we are trying to get this program, which should be very exciting right now, off the ground instead of diving into these deep weeds of of process that is not necessary. So. Okay. Further questions? Further comments? Alderman Pittner. Thank you, Mayor Olson. <clears throat> I just wanted to give my thoughts on this project and this application. Um, it's 
been about a year now we've been sitting with our stakeholder meetings talking about what we need in the community economic development how we want to be open for business and and this is one of those items that 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 has come up repeatedly and now we have an organization a proven organization a partner with the city stepping up to the plate and and i for one am, am very excited about it i'd have a question maybe for alderman straight um with with saying we we want to get out of the way and, and maybe maybe for for uh city manager city manager um slash finance director uh, lakefield is there a problem with leaving it at five hundred thousand and not adding the two hundred fifty thousand? i mean is there a reason to not forward the funds through the application i think that there might be a misunderstanding here the the total amount for the year stays at five hundred thousand this would be a $250,000 advance. So the amount doesn't change. It would just be that the money would be advanced to them prior to some loans being finalized or approved. Versus, and, and maybe I'm just not Versus understanding. reimbursement. Okay, so that's not how the application read to begin with? It was not to be $500,000 advancement? No. Okay, okay. Thank you for the clarification. Alderman Street. Uh, Mayor Olson, if I may. Um, I I recognize that we up here have, have dealt with some unfortunate bad dealings in the past. We've cleaned up some mistakes of the past. That's why I commend our attorney, our city manager, for ultimately trying to uh, maybe in a way protect us from the council standpoint. Nobody is looking to spend money uh, erroneously or waste public dollars. But what I've tried to convey at various meetings is we can't allow the mistakes of the past to force us to go so far rigid to the other extreme where we are adding layers of bureaucracy, frustrating our partners, ultimately where I think if I asked Lindsay right now to speak on, uh, on handling loans, this is unbelievably complicated by just involving the city. It's great that we have the dollars to allocate towards it, but I think we have to keep in mind, it's a revolving loan fund. They're gonna establish a second bank account. We're not building anything here. We're reinvesting the dollars back into this community. And I, I firmly understand where Mr. Lakefield is and our city attorney, but let's keep in mind what the end goal is and not allow these details because of the unfortunate issues of the past derail what is ultimately a fantastic opportunity for us to to go back to our entrepreneurs to businesses in the community it's their dollars ultimately and send the larger message to the bank of north dakota that's also going to be promoting this program that minot has it together and we are ultimately recognizing that and and that's allow service basin to do the work Alderman Padagula. So am I correct in understanding that the only significant difference between this amendment and what was originally proposed is pre-funding versus post-funding? Uh, Mayor Olson and Alderman Padagula, currently as it stands, we are not going to front service base in any money. So my amendment is basically saying service Basin wants to do the work. We're giving the money right now so they can go out and run the program as designed and not have the additional step where the money has to come back through and be reapproved or at least looked at by city staff. So you're saying yes, essentially, to my question? Yes. Yes. It's pre-funding versus post-funding. Well, I or simultaneously you, funding you versus can look at it as pre-funding. I think that you should also look at it as we are setting the program up. Capitalizing. We're capitalizing on, on the 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 opportunity in front of us and we are not looking to uh, meddle in the details, so to speak. We're, we're trusting our partner at Cirrus Basin. I do think it's important to note too that historically, um, the way that this contract was written up is the way that we have right. done business with other um, agencies and groups within our community. Um, you know, I, I think especially of the community facilities funding um, any of those agencies who we trusted as well, um, it was reimbursed dollars. It was not money given in advance. Alderman Pajagula. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not being critical of the idea of pre-funding. Um, maybe if I can make an analogy, because again, I'm not very good with money and this kind of stuff, you'll forgive me. But it's kind of like when the college asked for a million bucks for seats in the dome. 
we gave them a grant of a million bucks. We didn't ask for them to s give us a copy of the contract or a voice in the selection of the contractor or what kind of seats they should be or how comfortable they should be, the seats, or how big or anything. They wanted seats. We gave them money for seats. They spent it for seats. We gave them the, the money. Uh, and we left the selection process up to them. We trusted them, as the expression goes, or as the fact goes. Is that correct, then? If this is analogous to that. I would say yes. Mr. Then I'm satisfied. Madam Mayor, Alderman Padragula, you're exactly right. Um, in that process, um, we did grant them the money. We required them to raise a portion of the money as a match yes, sir. Um, and to provide proof of that before we would proceed with uh, the project. And then uh, there being uh, another public entity had to go through the bidding process, similar to what we would as a city. And then they submit those expenses or costs to us and we reimburse them for them. So we don't, once they go through that process, we don't just write them a check for the amount of the grant. It's done after the fact. Um, and the reason we came up with this was, is kind of a compromise in this instance because uh, obviously they don't have the, the capitalization for this revolving loan fund, uh, fund up front. So that's why we wrote in the language that once it's gone through the approval process, um, we'd require some notice that we could fund that prior to loan closing, but on it basically as a just in time type of process instead of advance funding it. Um, as you know, that there is some opportunity cost when that money has left uh, the coffer, so to speak. It's not earning interest, and there was some discussion uh, during the, the contract um, committee. You know, that is probably interest money that should go back to uh, the magic fund. Um, you know, we're, it's, it's a new program, so we don't know exactly the timing and, you know, when this need is going to develop. So it could be right away next week or next month. Um, there may be some lag time before these loans start coming in. So we're trying to check as many of the boxes off as we could, still stay within the Magic Fund guidelines and still accomplish the end result uh, that was proposed here with this application. So would I be correct in saying that this is just in time funding rather than pre-funding or post-funding? Madam Mayor, yes, Alderman please. Padragula, the original contract would be considered, uh, in my opinion, just in time. Uh, the proposed amendment would be advanced funding um, the application. Further discussion? Any further discussion? Alderman Walski? Mayor Olson, no. Uh, Thank you. I've, I've appreciated the discussion here. Ultimately, we're still considering the amendment yes. uh, to uh, to adopt uh, this different procedure versus what's in the the, the contract in the agenda. Um, I do continue to to support the agenda, or, or excuse me, the uh, the amendment, um, and that's it, it. Really comes down to, in my opinion, um, the administrative savings. Uh, we we have a process through which Surface Space and Planning Council goes through where they're. Uh, uh, vetting applicants, partners, all these sort of uh, ad additional steps that they need to go through. And uh, to add an additional step is additional administration. It's additional time. It's additional expense. Uh, time is always expense. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, um, it, it, it's a complicating additional process for an organization that isn't greatly benefiting from this particular program. Um, and, and Lindsay, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, uh, but Surf Space and Planning Council does not see returns uh, for their internal organization until these loans have been revolved a few times and they're starting to collect the interest back into the, the process. And so there's, um, there's work going out the door here. Uh, there's risk going out the door here in terms of that investment of effort. And I think it's appropriate to capitalize the program so that that organization has uh, uh, has the ability to go out and say, we can do this, we can do this tomorrow, we're ready to be a player in this game without having to come back to us each and every time for a, a, a $10,000 or a $20,000 or up to a $72,000 request. So. Any further discussion? Mr. Lakefield. Madam Mayor, if I may address to um, the, the perception that there will be a, a lot of administrative time saved here, I think that's a little bit of a misconception because that work will still need to be done. It will just be done after the fact instead of up front. And that is part of the concern is that with the proposed process in the original contract, we'll check those boxes off right away up front before we send the money. 
um, by advanced funding, we are still going to have to track that money through the life cycle. It's just going to be additional steps on the city side, as well as SERS Basin Planning Council throughout the process and after the fact. So I don't think that there's a huge um, administrative time savings by advanced funding it because we're going to eat up that, that time savings up front with additional work that needs to be done after the fact. Further discussion? Further discussion? Alderman Strait? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I guess to Mr. Lakefield's point, um, uh, Cirrus Basin is not uh, charging an administrative fee within this. Uh, I guess I, I, I have another statement that I guess we're going to have to enter in here at some point that uh, I think if we start going back on what the Magic Fund Steering Committee is ultimately determined and now we're we're needling in that. I, I think that sends the wrong message also to the Magic Fund Steering Committee that um, they've made a recommendation and now we've gone to the contract committee and now we're back. It, again, we're, we're into the process that is, um, we, we shouldn't be here. And the, the money that's going to ultimately go to this program, the little bit that's going to come out of the interest is going to sit in what is the revolving loan fund which ultimately we're all hoping is going to be an incredible benefit to our community. So I, I can understand and I appreciate Mr. Lakefield's point, but I, I think that we also have to keep in mind, and we've asked our partners to step up. We have to trust them. Minot State, uh, it, it's different. We are not building a brick and mortar. We're not fixing seats. We're creating a very non-traditional loan fund that's been established all around the state and people have been looking at us for years saying, why do you guys not have this? And I think that it's a question of why we haven't, but I think under the, the current situation, the Magic Fund has approved this. Let's give Service Space and the money and let them work. And they're gonna provide a quarterly report back to us of all of these dealings. So we are gonna have oversight there as well and reporting back. Alderman Pittner. Thank you, Mayor Olson. Uh, I just wanted to <clears throat> echo a comment of Alderman Strait that Service Basin is is not asking for any of these funds to cover administrative fees on their side, which they're eating that that cost, that work. Um, now I'm going to wear my citizen hat for a little bit. That if I'm being have have a sales tax in place that gets dispersed into the magic fund, do I want it sitting there accumulating interest? Am I getting taxed just to gain interest? Or am I getting taxed so that my tax dollars can go to work and potentially on a conservative side? earn a one to six dollar return six dollars on one dollar that's that's what i would like to see us as a council doing and those are the tools that i'd like to see put in place that's why we were elected is to make these decisions to put these things out in the community yes i understand it's going to be work whether it be on the front end or the back end but undercapitalization for any business is a cardinal sin so i support this amendment i support this 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 concept but as a taxpayer i mean i can you guys can, I mean, we can just not tax them and they can accumulate interest on their own <laughs> at their own bank account. We don't have to have it in our coffers. Let's put it to work. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Call the roll on the amendment, please. Straight? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Olson? No. Pittner? Yes. Padragula? Yes. The amendment passes, so now we will be considering. Um, the motion as amended. Is there any discussion on that? Alderman Walski? Mayor Olson, one question here for our uh, city manager and perhaps our city attorney. Um, the, the Magic Fund guidelines uh, state that uh, I think it's, uh, is it no more than 10% of the balance in the Magic Fund is available uh, in terms of what's in the fund on January 1 of the year uh, is available for the next year's funding. Um, with this particular prod proposal where we're funding money in 2019, uh, which is we have more than enough available based on an $8 million balance to, to fund $500,000 in total this year. If the balance funds uh, drops below $5 million for January 1, 2020, and that 10% number is less, um, we have sort of a conflict in the, the proposal that's passed today versus our policies. Um, is that kind of make sense to you guys or, or, or how do we how do we reconcile those two pieces when if we get to that point if there's less money in the magic fund in 2020 on January 1 mr. Lakefield 
Madam Mayor and Alderman Wolski, that is the reason behind some of the language that we included in the agreement. There's a, a number of moving pieces here. Uh, for example, there may be something in the works on January 1 for the Magic Fund that just hasn't been finalized. So technically, the money may be there on January 1. Um, it just may not have gone through the completion process. So we tried to put some language in here to make it as flexible as possible. Um, in addition, in some of the discussions, we're a little bit late in the year already to get this thing kicked off. So there's some discussion regarding whether they would be able to essentially make use of the entire $500,000 in year one because we're essentially in mid-year already and it's a new program. Um, so we tried to incorporate this to make it as flexible as possible and still accomplish the, the intent and, and the, the, you know, the intended purpose of the agreement. Um, to go along with that, one of the other things that we incorporated here was extending the term to mid-year in 2021 to kind of give that additional time on the back end of it as well. So again, the, the um, recommendation from the Magic Fund Screening Committee was 500000 in 19, 500000 in 2020. So we tried to write the agreement to accommodate that, if at all possible, with some safeguards should something else develop in the meantime that uh, we're not aware of right now. And extending the due date or the deadline at the term on the agreement um, just was the ability to, you know, hopefully see this through. And I think the consensus was that, um, you know, that, that deadline is something that uh, could potentially be amended by in the future by the council as well to um, allow this um, program some additional time if they haven't spent all the money yet. Sure. Mayor, Alderman Olski. I, I appreciate the comments, um, and I and I think it's just uh, just calling attention to the fact that, that we have a potential conflict in in terms of the the way the policy reads, and I, I appreciate you guys uh, uh, catching that, uh, bringing forward the uh, uh, the uh, an understanding and acknowledgement of that circumstance. If if we happen to get there in 2020, if no magic fund dollars go out over the next eight months, it, it essentially becomes a, a moot point. But if there are additional projects that come forward, we have um, we have intent from council that might not be perfectly aligned with policy guidelines. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Seeing none, call the roll on the amended motion, please. Pittner? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Straight? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Olson? Yes. Motion passes. All right, we will move on to item 5.2, which is a public hearing to authorize Visit MyNet to proceed with RFQ to lead to Magic Fund Grant. A public hearing, uh, Visit MyNet has requested that the City Council <laughs> authorize an RFQ to be issued to select a consultant to develop a coordinated community-wide branding strategy for economic development with details of an agreement to serve as basis for drafting the agreement with the City to secure up to $300,000 from the Magic Fund. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak to this item? Ms. Wilford. Good evening. Hi, I'm Stephanie Hoffert. My address is 2051 12th Street Northwest here in Minot. I'm the president and CEO of the Minot Area Development Corporation, and I'm here to respectfully request the council to support the Magic Fund application for a unified marketing campaign for Minot. My board of directors passed support for this application at our March 14th board meeting. The combined effort and collaboration from MADC, Visit Minot, and the Chamber of Commerce is a reflection of the hard work of all the technical teams that were formed after the International Economic Development Council assessed the Minot community. This recommendation was also supported by the full IEDC steering committee. I'm going to ask Ryan Kuhn from Visit Minot to come up and make a couple comments as well. And I want to thank you for your consideration tonight for this application. Thank you. Ms. Kuhn. Good evening. Brian Kuhn. I live at 224th Street Southwest. I want to talk a little bit about this project because it's been in the works for a while. Um, as Stephanie indicated, this is a direct result from the IEDC technical white papers. It was a resounding resolution from almost every single one, and so we want to take the opportunity to move on it and capitalize on it. Um, there are a couple things inside the letter from Mr. Zakian that says an RF. P. Um, we are going to move forward with an RFQ. It's listed two different ways, so I just want to make sure you guys are clear on that. Um, moving forward with an RFQ provides many more benefits in terms of 
Um, it's a qualification-based selection, so we're not looking at the price. We want to look at the qualifications of the experts that can submit for this project. That expert advice is going to encourage those respondents to bring innovative solutions and drive value um, because they don't have to worry about being the low bidder. <clears throat> So this project, as I said, was a direct resolution of the white papers. Um, that RFQ and the way that it will look uh, will allow the agencies to provide back to us, which again is a little bit different from previous Magic Fund requests, uh, the scope of work as well as the deliverables and the timeline in which this project will actually come into fruition. The RFQ, it's planned, um, ready to be released on the Visit Minot website pending your approval tonight and it'll run for 21 days and, um, and inside the four major newspapers around the state to give everybody an opportunity to provide feedback on this. Uh, each organization will have two representatives that review those, or not applications, I'm sorry, to review those um, RFQs that come back, and then those RFQs we're gonna ask to not exceed eight pages because sometimes marketing RFQs can get a little fluffy. Um, we don't need all the extra fluff. We want your qualifications so we can select based on who is truly qualified to handle this project. Once that uh, selection is made by our two representatives from each organization, uh, we will be able to facilitate that contractual process, and then at that point, bring that back to the city. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Coon? Alderman Pittner. Ms. Thank you, Mayor uh, Wilson. Uh, Ms. Coon, who, who will sit on the selection committees? So we'll have two representatives from each of the organizations, so two from Visit Minot, two from MEDC, and two from the Chamber. Okay. Follow-up question, if I may, Mayor. Um, thank you. Is, is there been any consideration since this is a Minot wide, having, having anyone from the city of Minot, whether it be staff or council, sit on uh, this selection committee? So that's an excellent question. So because our three organizations are going to facilitate this process, we wanted to make sure that uh, we can truly pick the agency that's going to be correct for this. What we will do is all of the members of the one brand technical team, once that agency has been selected, will be able to be looped back into that process. So there were several people um, just because we don't want to get it too big. The bigger you get, the harder it is to get work completed. And so those individuals, um, plus the addition of Derek Hackett as recommended by um, Manager John Berry, would be added onto that to help steer in terms of uh, the timeline, deliverables, and scope of work from the agency. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none? Uh, no. Oh, Alderman uh, Wilson, yes. Get her up. Mayor Olson, um, thank you. I, uh, uh, m you know, maybe what, uh, Ryan, I appreciate your, your comments there. Um, I share Alderman Pittner's uh, uh, thoughts regarding the, the RFQ selection committee process. Um, to that end, I, I actually have uh, some questions for, for Ms. Hoffert. Um, I'll, I'll have one more oh, for Ms. Kay. Okay, you have another. Or maybe just a thought. We'll bring Ms. Hoffert up in a second, so go Perfect. ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just, you know, even even with the addition of, of Mr. Billingsley with our, you know, economic development coordinator, might be a thought to, to be part of this process. Obviously, this is, we're, we're trying to get our economic development and our, and our image kind of rebranded. Yeah. To, my, to my thought, one of the reasons that this project is coming forward is because of the disconnection maybe between some of this or these organizations to have as many organizations that's why I bring it up having all the players at the table throughout this process even even from the beginning I understand it can get a little dysfunctional but to me that's that's my thought having 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 more uh, people involved from the different org organizations that this will affect directly that's that's my uh, sorry Brian if, if I'm offering you up for, for, for uh, <laughs> to be on a committee, but like I say, just, just my thoughts I wanted to share. All right, thank you. Ms. Hoffert. Oh, Mr. McMartin. Just a friend. <laughs> John McMartin, president of the Minot Area Chamber of Commerce, 213 7th Street Southeast. The three of us didn't dream this up. Came from the IEDC white papers. The steering committee asked the three of us to put this together and bring it forth as it is. On that steering committee sits the mayor and the city manager. We didn't sit in what the chamber used to get accused of is a cigar smoke filled room and dream up something. 
we responded respectfully to the to folks from the city in putting this together and trying to steer it forward. We aren't hiding anything. We aren't doing anything out of the ordinary that we were not asked to do. And I just wanted that on the record. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Or you still would like Ms. Hoffert to come forward? I would, yes. All right. um, Mr. Mark McMartin, if, if uh, any part of this you want to speak to, you're welcome to afterwards, too. Um, Go ahead. Uh, Ms. Hoffert, you're getting this asked this question tonight because your board president isn't here. Uh, but obviously, Ms. Ms. Kramer, as the president of the MADC board, is also closely tied to an organization that uh, would very likely seek this work. Um, so can you speak to me in terms of uh, how are we going to go about sort of insulating this RFQ process uh, with that very intimate connection uh, it, that exists in the room? Uh, and I'm not making any suggestion of, of anything other than this is a challenge that we have to encounter, and I'm curious as to how we're going to go about doing sure. it. Sure. Alderman Walski, I think uh, to start with, it's not just me making that decision or my board making the decision. It's all three entities. And so we're going to look at the qualifications of whoever submits their RFQ to us. And I don't think that... Our three entities would choose somebody just because Ms. Kramer is the chair of my board. We want to do what's best for Minot and our community, and we want to be looking as one united front, which other communities have done over and over again, and we seem to have missed the boat several times. You look at Watford City, you look at Williston. I, I've heard lately that Tioga is going to be spending over $150,000 for their community. So it's not about who gets this who, who wins the award here, it's about what's best for Minot. And I, that's how I feel, and I think my board chair would think similar, and I believe she does. But in any case, I'm not looking at names of people, I'm looking at what the qualifications are and what's gonna help move the needle for Minot and make sure that we are progressive instead of always missing the boat, because we've done it too many times. Thank you. Mayor Olson, Ms. Holford, I appreciate your comments. This is this is a delicate issue, right? Uh, because this, this this conflict of interest yep. um, it exists. It's there, and so it's important for us, I think, on council to 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 bring these things out in the open Absolutely. and have these discussions here. Um, and so, uh, I, I I am uh, uh, excited about this particular work moving forward. Um, I think this is a, an obvious and uh, uh, important recommendation that came out of the IEDC work. Um, I see this uh, as, when we say branding, I think oftentimes the public will, um, they hear things like logo and they, they think pictures. Yeah. This is much, much more than that. Uh, this is about discovering what our identity is. And it's, um, it's very significant work. It's not easy work to get down to that deep part of our identity where we all share. Uh, the common thread where we go from there because all of these organizations um, need to uh, grab hold of whatever we come up with here and make it their own in some particular way. Um, with that, I, I do um, uh, want to offer a, well, we don't, we're still in the public hearing. We don't we actually have a formal amendment exactly. yet. Exactly, yeah. yes. Um, so I'll, I'll wait. And Alderman Walski, I just want to say, I, I hope you all understand that we are adults on three of these organizations, and we certainly would not pick one, one agency over another just because of a, a relationship that they may have with one of our boards. We want to do what's best for Minot, and we've been asked to come out of the silos and do that, and that's what my intention and the other two organizations as well. And we're not going to be doing this on our own either, like Mr. McMartin stated. You know, the IEDC steering committee includes downtown, it includes the city manager, it includes the mayor. I mean, we've got we've got service base in there as well. We're, we're trying to cover the whole gamut, and we're hoping that we will hit the target. We don't want to lose this one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, momentarily, um, city attorney, could you give us a one-minute clarification on a conflict of interest, how that would look in this situation? <clears throat> Madam Mayor, there is a state statute that references conflicts of interest, and it talks about when there's a personal or pecuniary interest that's substantial. Um, a member of a board is, is not allowed to vote on that unless the rest of the board 
um, permits that person to vote. Um, how it would work with a board member being involved, that may depend on what MADC has for policies internally for their conflicts, but that's the only state law relating to conflicts of interest. Thank you. And city attorney, I'll, I'll let you know that when we did, when my board did approve this on March 14th to support this, she did abstain from voting. Thank you. Alderman Pittner. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Olson, um, that, I, I just wanted to maybe clarify my comments with having the city of mind at the table for the RFQ um, selection process um, to, and, and maybe to wrap in Stephanie's comments as well. There are, every, we're all adults here. We're all, we all know, we all have the best interests of mine at, 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 at heart, and that's that's our wishes. Um, and I think for this to go, like Alderman Wolski said, this is deeper than pictures or logos or branding. This is a this is a broad project. This is a huge project. You have communities all over the state, like Stephanie had stated, that are investing in this. And that's why I felt it was important, not that I was acute, trying to make anybody feel uncomfortable or that this is something happening behind the scenes. That's just why I felt like maybe our economic development director or, or, or someone from city staff be at the table because this is so broad and covers so many bases. I'd hate for something to get missed throughout this, this process um, of the selection committee. That's why I made my comments. That's, I just wanted to clarify that. And Alderman Pittner, I do believe Brian Billingsworth is also on our committee. Is that fair? Yeah. All right. Alderman Padragula. Um, I don't want to get into debate until we talk about it in, in, in depth here, but there are two questions I have. Um, the first question has to do with uh, to what extent the city uh, economic development director or director of planning and economic development is, is a part of the committee. Uh, I'm, you know, I thought originally it was two from MADC, two from Visit Minot, two from Correct. the chamber. Do, do city staff have any kind of uh, ex officio role in that or not? I don't want to... Alderman, Alderman Padrigal, I'm sorry. The, he is part of the IEDC steering committee, so the, the group with the mayor, city manager, downtown association, Service Basin, MADC, Visit Minot. I understand yep. that, but would he be part of the group helping choose uh, the uh, RFQ person? At, at this point, no. Okay. Um, second question, I guess, would be whether uh, Alderman Pittner wanted to introduce an amendment uh, to put them on there. Um, we, we don't have a motion okay. on the table yet. Okay, okay, fine. Um, the second question, or second issue, really has to do with this conflict of interest. Um, I want to be very emphatic about this. I really don't care what the state law says. That's a minimum threshold. If you're involved in choosing somebody, and I don't care which organization or which individual, I don't know which individual, but when Alderman Walski brought this up, this really worries me. I don't care what the law says. The law is a minimum standard for me. And if you're going to be benefiting in any fashion potentially from this, I don't care what your board says. I don't, you know, they have, you have your rules, you have your ground rules, whatever. Personally, as a member of the council, my feeling is very strong on this. If you have any personal involvement, I don't think you can vote. And I don't care what the law says, and I don't care what the bylaws say, and, and the other people on the board. If you have a personal vested pecuniary financial interest in something, I think you have to recuse yourself. And she did. But in any decision regarding who gets the contract. She won't be in the decision-making process. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, there's no, we would not choose her to be part of the process. Okay. Okay. That's fine then. Perfect. And, and I think it's important to add in here too. We can have our personal opinions, but we do need to follow state law as well. I mean, that's that's, that's giving us our basis to to right. know what we do. But morality often has a higher basis than law, and that's that's the point I'm trying to make. The law is a minimum threshold, a minimum standard. And I personally, especially given what's happened and the, some of the concerns in the community, I'm not satisfied with with that being the upper limit. I think that's the absolute <laughs> lower limit. That's all I want to say. I know the law is important. I'm not saying we should be disrespectful to it, but I think there are times when we need to ask more than the law demands of us, and I think this is one of them. All right. Alderman Street. Uh, thank you, Mayor Olson. I, I guess just to speak to this point, um, the conversation's out in the public. Uh, Stephanie, thanks for stepping up tonight, answering the question. Uh, as the city council representative that sits on Visit Minot, I'm, I'm excited about this work. Uh, I appreciate Ryan. I think the whole board from Visit Minot might be here today, which I think is great. Um, the, the other side of the conversation, which ultimately is going to come out and Stephanie, it's coming out under this guise of this magic fund request, but we, we're having it internally for um, larger contracts for public works and work that's just, 
it goes on and there's an appearance. And so we have to have the conversation out in the public. I think it's great. But it also gets at the conversation of how we support local businesses, local businesses that are employing people here. And if they're doing the quality work that people select, I think we have to back that up as well. Um, by us having the conversation tonight, it's healthy, it's important, but it also is going to lend itself into another conversation down the road of, of how we really do support local business, local contractors, when we have the issue that we face up here, oftentimes that's hotly debated of the lowest bid. And so um, I'm glad we're having the conversation. I don't think anybody means ill will, but I'm excited about the process. I, I trust the people that are at the table. I appreciate Mr. Hackett's name being thrown into the fray as much as Mr. Billingsley, because um, we're approving it tonight and the eyes come back to us. Just like I had said earlier that I want us to get out of the way. I trust the smarter people in the room about marketing dollars, you know, as long as we're gonna sell corn dogs at the end of the day. But anyway, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any further questions for Ms. Hoppert? No. Thank you. Or did, did you have a question no. for her? Okay. Alderman Malski, go ahead. If there's nothing else to discuss here, I would move we close the public hearing and uh, approve the item. Second. Um, and if I might offer, uh, it sounds like Alderman Padragula uh, was was maybe going to contemplate offering an amendment. Um, if he doesn't, I certainly would, uh, because it's this uh, the same concern that that there are there be city involvement um, in the selection of this particular uh, contractor who ultimately fulfills this work for us. Because uh, at the end of the day, it is not uh, visit Minot and the chamber and MADC. Uh, it is. It is we Minot executing this work, and uh, and I appreciate these three organizations taking the lead on it, but but I think from a public perspective, it's important that we have um, a, a member of council as a part of this selection committee, uh, a member of our city staff as a member of this selection committee, and I would even extend it further to uh, to add one additional member of the public. Um, I, I think this part of the process is critically important to uh, not only ensuring we get the best contractor, because I, I believe the committee, as it's assigned right now, would deliver that to us, but it's about uh, assigning trust to the process. Uh, and so uh, if Mr. Uh, Pittner didn't want to make that amendment, I would certainly offer it. Second. Okay. Any discussion on the, excuse me, on the amendment? Yeah, like the other people have spoken, I, I really like this idea, and I'll offer some other comments in a few minutes. But um, in terms of the, the proposed nature of the selection committee, would the current three organizations involved in it and named on it have any concerns or objections or problems with that? I think we're striking a balance between accountability, and I very much thank Alderman Walski and Alderman Pittner for raising that issue and the need for the for the council in some way to be involved at some in some fashion at some point. Um, on the other hand, I don't want to make this cumbersome, this process cumbersome. Um, we're talking about a lot of money, and I guess I want to hear the opposite side, or not the, the opposite, I want to hear the, the views of the people who are currently on it, if they, if they see enlarging the committee being problematic in any fashion. Um, we have closed the-, the Oh, I'm sorry. The, well, it's um, a question to them. Uh, it's not a public comment, it's a question to them. Okay. Um, who would you like to answer the question? Is there any? If any of them would. One of the three, if you would like to come forward, either Mr. McMartin or Ms. Kuhn or Ms. Hofford, if you'd like to address that question. He's getting jabbed in the back. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know that it would provide concerns to expand the committee. It just drags things out longer. It, more people to talk, more things, more things happening. Uh, if you were to say uh, a city council member and Mr. Billingsley, I think that makes sense. Again, I reiterate that it was not the three of us that dreamt this up. It was the IEDC group, the white papers that came back from the technical committees, and then the steering committee itself, not Stephanie and not Phyllis and not myself, but the other members of the steering committee that said, the three of you are the ones that are poised to pick up this one of nine or 10 areas that were identified as unclaimed pieces that the technical committees weren't gonna to continue to work on. 
and that included the mayor and the city manager asking us to move forward, the three organizations, to make this happen. Now, the council needs to approve this. If you decide to add other people, who, who are we to tell you no? But I think going outside of the city at this particular juncture to pick um, John, Gene, or Judy out of the air uh, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It, it perhaps does if you want to add it a council member and, and, some, and uh, uh, Mr. Billingsley or somebody else. But I think we've already had that input, but again, that's your decision. In, in response, I want to clarify, I'm not saying, and I haven't heard any, well, maybe there's somebody out there, but I haven't heard him say that, you know, this was cooked up in some back room. I want to be very emphatic about that, John. Yep. Uh, you know, I trust the people involved here. But again, it's not the, prov not the issue of the provenance of the suggestion. It's the quality of the suggestion. I and that's what, I'm, that's what I'm addressing. Right. No, I, and I think as, as you look at some of the stuff that's in the blogosphere, I think the blogosphere suggests there's back rooms and dark I, corners. I know nothing of the blogosphere. I, okay. I literally know nothing of it, and I care nothing. <laughs> All right. Alderman Pittner. Thank you, Mayor Olson. Uh, and and I, I think this is the reason I bring this up is just the more people we have at the table, this is something that we're going to wear as far as the the branding the one brand this is something the city's going to wear for a long time hopefully 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 we do it right and we do it once that's why i think it's so important and we have enough people whether it be on the council or city staff or out in the public that are involved i mean we could probably name a dozen a piece off the top of our head people that are truly involved whether it be in business owners or nonprofits or community projects different organizations, whether it be the, the park board or the school board. I mean, there's people that are, that are just like us, donating their time and, and, and ideas and, and, and thoughts. So I think it's, I think it's important um, with Alderman Wolski's uh, motion to have someone from the, from the, the public because it's gonna, this is what the public is going to wear. This is going to be the brand. This is going to be our image, what the rest of the state thinks of Minot, North Dakota, what our <coughs> Canadian neighbors to the north think of Minot. This is going to be our identity. So I think it's very, very important that we have as much and, and, and something that Mr. McMartin, one of my first council meetings, and I've used this several times, so I have to uh, thank him, but he came to the, the podium and he, he said when we were talking about an item, haste makes waste. And I think hastily going through this process um, would be a mistake. And I think we need to take our time with this, select the right, uh, uh, entity, the, the right contractor to do this so that we cover all of our bases. That's that's why I think it's so important to have as many people in, involved in this process as possible. Alderman Street. Uh, Mayor Olson, I, I'm, I'm curious your opinion of this, partly because uh, I, I, I understand what everybody's saying. I, I, as the city representative, I sit on Visit Minot. So I, I guess I'm a little, like, perplexed of um, I'm, I'm already there. I'm not on this review committee, but uh, I guess I'm just curious of of everybody's take on of who. <laughs> First off, uh, I I understand everybody's point, but I already sit on Visamina. I'm already reviewing the work. Um, I guess I just wanted to point that out and reiterate. Much like I I sit on Cirrus Basin, that's why I was animated earlier. Um, if we need more people, or if you want me to be larger uh, role playing, um, I guess, speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> Fine. Alderman Walski. I'm not, Olson, and I'm you. not looking to micromanage or uh, yep. offer myself up there. Um, you know, uh, as I propose this, uh, our mayor has uh, a lot of discretion in uh, making these particular appointments. And so that would have been the assumption built into um, my amendment was that Mayor Sitma would uh, appoint somebody to, to serve in this particular role from uh, w with intake from city staff and whether it's Mr. Billingsley, who I think is qualified. We have Mr. Hackett, who's intimately involved with our communications and, and uh, 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 the city identity. So I think we have a number of people who are, are qualified and could fill in this particular role. As for council, again, while we have mayor's discretion, as for a member of the public, we have people who can reach out and express interest, in, and we have mayor's discretion at, at making this particular appointment. So, um, and I, um, um, so if that helps inform. So, for my clarification, would the, would these three additional people only serve on the RFQ process? 
that's it. That's where their authority would lie, and it would end after the recommendation was made. Well, and, and that's my assumption is that that's the that, that's the the selection process, um, and there's also a. Uh, uh, contract review process. I, I don't know if anybody would care to speak to that next step, um, but uh, uh, I, I, let's focus on this sure. item. Sure. Right I, I mean, that, that was what it was offered for: is the selection process. Okay. So. Alderman Pittner. And I just wanted to echo that clarification. That that's that's where my these individuals would sit on there from the two from the three organizations as well as the uh, individual stated in the amendment. That's all I'm looking for is through the selection process of the contractor having more eyes on it so that we don't miss anything. And well, then I'm after that, they can go away. To answer your question, Madam Mayor, um, I think the city needs to be involved. We just spent a ton of time and a ton of money hiring one development professional and we're in the market for another one. And I think it only makes sense to have city staff involved in the selection process. I also like the idea of an alderman. We typically have aldermen on selection committees. Next month, I'm going to be on one in some software area. Historically, we've always had an alderman, or almost always, on, on selection committees. As for a citizen, I'm not so keen. I think I'm leaning more toward John's position that, you know, if it takes time, and I think Sean can make a quick decision. Um, if it takes time, it's an extra person. I'm, I don't see the need quite quite as much for that because each of these groups is somewhat broadly con constituted, and I think city staff and an alderman would have the interest of the public in mind. But I don't I don't think it's worth making a fuss over that, and it's not something I oppose. I don't think it distract detracts a whole lot. It probably adds something. So my thought is to you know make the do a better job making the initial selection, and when that selection is made, we leave it up to the firm to develop a proposal which will ultimately come to us. And I'm, I'm very comfortable with that overall process. But again, since this is a significant change in, in how the magic fund has functioned, in a significant investment of public funds, 300 grand, um, I think the more eyes on it to begin with, the more likely we are to have a better outcome. So I would strongly support the amendment. Did you have a comment, Mr. McMurn? No? <laughs> ultimately, after the selection is made, the contract comes back through the contract review committee that uh, the acting city manager sits on, and uh, as, well as, I. as do you, Mayor Olson. <laughs> uh, we're going to be bringing that back, and it'll come back to council. All right. That's Thank you. part. That's part of. That's part of the recommendation from the Magic Fund. Any further discussion on the amendment? <laughs> Seeing none. Call the roll, please. Wolski. Yes. Olson. Yes. Pittner. Yes. Padragula. Yes. Straight. Yes. Any discussion on the amended motion? One brief item, Mayor Olson. Thank you. Just uh, as a request, uh, as we get into that contract uh, drawing process, uh, because it's doubtful that this will come back before council in between the time when we see that. But um, Minot State went through this process. Uh, I think within the last year, year and a half. I feel like it was maybe earlier this winter or last fall when their uh, new branding was introduced. Um, I was very impressed with that process. I was very impressed with the result that they got. Uh, I would request that we take a look at the contract that they issued in terms of uh, getting a sense of what the deliverables were, the outcomes, et cetera, because I think um, that there, there is a model right here in town that has proved successful, and I think we should, we should avail ourselves of that opportunity. Alderman Pajagula. I think it's an important thing, and I just wanted to clarify, you know, why I'm going to vote the way I'm going to vote. Um, at first, I thought of this, I saw this as something that would evolve over perhaps years or certainly months uh, as the IEDC seeded things and as things grew and different committees worked and, and, and went farther with their work. Now it's become a little bit quicker than that, and I was a little reluctant with that change. But having heard and talked with many of the people involved, um, I'm okay with that. Um, so that's, that's one point. I, th I think the idea of creating an identity, the original presentation was that an identity would kind of grow and we would kind of uh, and develop through this process and then we would kind of capture that, we would, we would solidify that in some way. But I, I'm okay with it proceeding faster. The second comment I wanted to make is that 
I think we're going to be, in a sense, creating part of our identity rather than discovering. I think it's more than just discovery. And that's what appeals to me, that we take some time or the consultants take some time and step back and look at that. In a way, it reminds me a lot of the visioning process the chamber had, what, some 20-some years ago, 25 years ago. And it was a very healthy process for the community. And again, emphasize the word process, something that you know people are involved in, in this case, marketing and, and you know other kinds of professionals, and then take some time. Um, the third comment I want to make is I don't see this in any way as being an advertising campaign. Um, I think it's a much broader, as Alderman Pittner mentioned, and I think Alderman Walski, it's a much broader way of looking at who we are as a community and coming up with a consistent message, a consistent way of talking about who we are, of identifying our weaknesses as well as our strengths, recognizing our weaknesses. And that's one of the things I loved about the IEDC process. They said, look, these are some problems that you got, and we're trying to address them now. So uh, if it's conceived of as as a broader process of, of refining our identity, creating it, discovering it, and then communicating it in a consistent fashion, that makes a lot of sense to me. It's not a bunch of flags put up on flagpoles. It's not a bunch of billboards. If it were, I would strongly oppose it. But I think it's something more and more sophisticated than that, and my, that's my hope. So I will be supporting this, and I, I think it's a significant change from what we've had, and I think it's a significant step forward for our community. Any further discussion on the amended motion? Alderman Street. Uh, Mayor Olson, I, I guess I just want to speak to the excitement that sometimes we get a little caught up up here and we just, ooh, loses the excitement. The reason why I'm excited to visit Minot's taking the helm here is there's such great things happening in this community right now. And it, whether you want to look at it from uh, the community facilities funds that helped uh, renovate the dome that's in the works, the Children's Museum being discussed, what's happening at the State Fair, Trinity building a new hospital. There's a lot of great work. Uh, we have people that want to step up and do the work, and I, I'm excited about it. I appreciate all of you in the audience and all you bring to the table and your work. Um, that's why this is exciting right now, and um, I, I think it's, it's important that we keep our eyes on that excitement as well. Thank you, Mayor Olson. Alderman Pittner. Thank you, Mayor Olson. I guess I'll, if Shannon gets to talk about how excited he is, I guess I get my <laughs> chance too. Uh, again, th th this this uh, this item, as well as the previous one, these are a little bit outside of the box as far as things we've seen come through the Magic Fund um, uh, request. I think it's the first one since I've been elected. I think the last one was last May. Right. So uh, from what I've seen in the community, again, this is this is a sign not only to these organizations that are willing to take up the helm and, and these projects, but to anybody else out there with ideas that can improve the community. We're open for business. We, we're, we're willing to listen. We're willing to entertain these ideas. Um, again, I, I'm, I'm, again, I too am excited about this as, and all these items. So thank you. All right. Call the roll. Wolski? Yes. Olson? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Pittner? Yes. Straight? Yes. All right, motion passes. We will move on to um, number six, our consent items. I have been asked to pull item 6.5. Are there any others that anyone in the audience or anyone up here would like to see pulled? Eight, please. 610. Was there, a, Mayor Olson, was there an amendment to or a correction to a SRT item? That, that's 610, yep. Okay. <coughs> Anything else? Oh, okay. Is that? Uh, yeah, that was just brought, so okay. if, if we... Um, we can approve the corrected 6.10 item okay. in consent if that's all, all right with everyone up here. All right, I would entertain a motion. I'd move consent on uh, uh, all items except 6.5. And 8 Thank also. Oh, I said eight. Not oh, ten. six eight. Okay. Six point five and six point eight. All right. Second. Any discussion? Call the roll. Wolski. Yes. Olson. Yes. Pittner. Yes. Padragula. Yes. Straight. Yes. Motion passes. Item six point five: the gaming site authorizations, annual gaming organization renewals. Move approval. Second. Okay. Discussion. Alderman Walski. Mayor Olson, thank you. Brief comment here. Uh, I've caught a couple news articles over the last few months uh, of communities uh, in the region being very intentional 
with their uh, charitable gaming revenue. Um, that is not our revenue to, uh, to, to disperse. It goes to the organizations working in the various gaming sites. Uh, but the authorizations of which organizations work in those sites is uh, to a certain degree at our discretion uh, in the event that we have policies that specifically guide it. Um, we don't right now. We have fairly loose policies that guide uh, who operates in our particular facilities. And I, I bring it up because with the loss of uh, the community facilities fund, which many people in town have come to me and said they, they want to see a revenue source for some of these particular community projects, I identify this gaming revenue as a, as a place where if uh, we were to take a little time, uh, it probably would even take a year or two to reconsider our gaming site authorization policies, we might see these dollars better directed towards uh, goals and outcomes in the community that we want to see achieved. Uh, we have some extraordinary gaming partners in this community. I don't want to cast any aspersions on what's happening right now. Uh, we've got Minot State, we've got Minot Junior Golf, Minot Hockey Boosters. All of these organizations are doing tremendous things and making great contributions. Uh, but but I, I simply see that there, there may be an opportunity to improve or be a bit more intentional here. So, Any further discussion? Alderman Strait. Uh, thank you, Mayor Olson. I guess just to follow up with that, Mr. Wolski, this conversation had also arisen at a downtown uh, business and professionals meeting where, um, as we all know, there's the little Chicago pub district, and it was I, I heard this being bantered about as a way where maybe there could um, that could also help with some of the downtown things that are being discussed, be it a, a position or obviously all those uh, businesses would have to play in mind, but I. I appreciate just the discussion point because I think it's a something different and creative. Any further discussion? Seeing none, call a roll. Wolski? Yes. Olson? Yes. Pittner? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Straight? Yes. Motion passes. Item 6.8 is Station 2 Roofing Project bid acceptance. Move. Second. Discussion. I wanted to. Yes. I wanted to ask a question of the fire chief uh, and or the engineer. Uh, how good are you on roofs, Madam Fire Chief? <laughs> Besides cutting holes in them and, and venting <laughs> and ventilating, yes. It holes in it. <clears throat> um, I wanted to ask you, um, and I apologize, I was out of town for a week and get a chance. This is something I want to talk about privately, not take everybody's time. But since it's 50 grand, um, What's the difference between ballasted and adhered, and why are we going with one kind of roof versus another? And what are the pros and cons of those kinds of roofs? Told you. <laughs> Can I phone a friend? Mad okay. Madam Mr. Mayor, Mr. Alderman Padragula, I could probably help you out a little bit All with right. this. The ballasted roof, if, and we can't see out this window, but typically it's, it's kind of the similar type of process with the ballasted roof, they use the P rock or gravel uh -huh. rock on the roof to essentially hold that material down. With the adhered process, they glue that down. So it's very similar type of product, similar type of warranty. Um, in this case, uh, the one was considerably right. cheaper than the other one. Mr. Flanagan looks like he's agreeing. Yeah, <laughs> gravel roof are much older fashioned. They're much more inexpensive. Adhered roofs are either torched down or they're glued down. They're more expensive. And they go in on sheets. Would ballasted be enough then, I guess, is my concern? Is what? Is ballasted enough? Is it good enough? It's Yeah, there's, they still do them. They still, it's, it's considered a built-up roof. They call it a built-up roof. It's, and that's a cheaper option? It's a little lower price, yeah. It doesn't last as long. They're more problematic, more maintenance. So should we go for the other kind? EPDM is the best roof you can buy, yeah. It's a layered roof. It's a me uh, it's a rubber membrane. That's but, a torch down roof. But it's twenty grand more. I would think so. But those, some of those are lifetime roofs. They last a long time. And which is which is the recommendation of city staff? Madam Mayor, Alderman Padragula, um, in this case, the recommended bid was the um, uh, the adhered roof uh, from Jessen Roofing. So in their bid, that was slightly more expensive. Um, it looks like about $1,602 more than the, the roof with the ballast. Uh -huh. um, so again, here, similar, a little bit different type of process and putting it down, but a little bit longer life expectancy in this case was the justification for the more expensive option. 
so we are taking the longer term cost into account here. Exactly. Which is in, okay, thank you. I didn't realize you were that multifaceted. You knew a lot about Bruce. <laughs> thank you. That's neat. <laughs> Any further questions? <laughs> Seeing none, call the roll. Pajagula? Yes. Straight? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Olson? Yes. Pittman? Yes. All right, let's move on to item 7.1, the JF Aviation LLC lease agreement. Move approval. <coughs> Second. Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, call the roll. Pittner? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Straight? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Olson? Yes. Item 7.2, authorized settlement to acquire 1124 6th Avenue Southwest. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Alderman Walski. Brief question for our city attorney. Does that mean that this item will be removed from our uh, annual or our monthly city attorney's report? Madam Mayor and Alderman Walski, yes, this one will. There is another um, related inverse condemnation that will not be. It hasn't been settled yet. We're taking one off the list. Yeah. All right. Any further discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, call a roll. Pittner? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Straight? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Olson? Yes. Motion passes. All right. I think we're ready to move on to our department report from our finance director slash acting city manager slash roof specialist. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm happy to be in front of you today to give you a presentation on some of the work that we do in the finance department. Um, our department is a little bit unique where we don't produce goods, so to speak. We don't drive shiny equipment that uh, entertains all kinds of kindergarten kids like Public Works uh, this time of year. We do a lot of the stuff that's kind of in the trenches and behind the scenes, and nevertheless, I like to feel is very important as well. One of the options that, uh, the advantages that we get to, to it, working in finance is that we get to work with a lot of these departments, and we get to learn a lot about what they do. So we learn a little bit about roofs and excavating and operating equipment and all kinds of different things if we pay a little bit of attention along the way. So I had a little bit of a struggle on how I'm gonna get up here and give this presentation because uh, statistics in our department are a little bit difficult. We can talk about the, you know, the amount of money we send out the door in payments or that we collect, the number of payments, you know, how many things we're involved with, but it's, it's a lot misleading because you know, over time, uh, the amount of, or the cost of doing business gets to be a little bit more every year. So those numbers are gonna be a little bit uh, deceptive. So what I thought I would do is I would take a couple hours here today and uh, walk us through 196 pages of the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. And apparently everyone thinks that's humorous. So uh, this is the, the cover of this year's edition of the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. And this is kind of the culmination of a year's worth of work um, in the finance department. It's a thrilling read. I think uh, all of you should spend some time to do that. And it would probably take us more than two hours to go through that tonight. So uh, I thought we were gonna have a short agenda and we we're gonna have lots of time, so we'll just have to move on. Uh, the cover picture this year is actually part of one of the, the stormwater pump stations that uh, the city is constructing um, as part of the flood control project. So we have a lot going on. Um, it keeps us really busy. All right, so my approach is just to kind of walk you through a year's process with the finance department. And uh, when we were talking about this in our department, I said it's kind of a little bit like the movie Groundhog's Day. We kind of go through this process and we get to the end and we start all over again. Um, so we're gonna start at the beginning of the year, but the first thing on our list is the year end. Um, once we get through January, we're concentrating on closing out the prior year, and that involves a lot of things like uh, going through and, and recording encumbrances for um, items that may be in the works from the prior year that the money hasn't actually got out the door, but it's actually a budget item from the prior year. So we encumber those funds um, to, to record those expenses in the prior year. Uh, so there's a lot of clerical 
type stuff, working with different departments to get those uh, things buttoned up um, at the end of the year. We start working on compiling all the financial documents in preparation for putting together the, the CAFR, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, and in preparation from the auditors uh, coming to visit us and take a look at our records. So that's our next step. We have uh, the CAFR put together, the auditors come and review our records. Um, they look over things like internal controls. If we have segregation of duties, they're gonna verify balances, they're gonna test documents to make sure we follow our processes and uh, you know dig into things and every year it's a little bit different to what they concentrate on we don't necessarily know that stuff ahead of time um, you know they pick funds at least uh, to some extent at random they pick transactions at random to give a sampling of what our business is throughout the year so we don't have that information up front so our way to prepare for that is, is we follow the rules and we make those records as complete as all possible. Um, and sometimes during the year we get the, you know, um, everybody thinks we're a little difficult because we make sure that people follow the rules and we're sticklers on that, but then we don't have surprises when the auditors come to visit us either. Um, I'm proud to announce that we do have our, our CAFR completed and again this year, we had an unqualified opinion from our independent auditors so a uh, clean bill of health, so to speak, from them. The next phase we go into, and it seems like the auditors are going out the door, we're finalizing our annual report, and we're already looking forward to next year's budget. Um, and we're already into that process. So we compile actual data from uh, the CAFR and from last year's financial records uh, to give the worksheets out to the department heads with actual data this year's budgeted data, and then allow them to do projections for 2020 and the five uh, subsequent years after that. So it's a very manual process. Um, some of the people in our department key that information into those spreadsheets manually. And then of course we have to double check it to make sure it's correct and it all balances. Um, and it's, it's a long process and uh, rightfully so. There, there's a lot at stake and we have to have the resources available to operate the city for the next year, but we have to be good stewards of the taxpayers' money as well. So it's a balancing act to make sure that we provide the services that everyone expects and the quality of services that everyone expects. Um, the thing is we're a little bit spoiled when we go to the tap and turn it on, you know, we get clean water and that clean water goes down the drain and disappears and we don't think twice of that. Somebody comes and picks up the trash, uh, the streets get swept, the streets get plowed, um, you know, if we dial 911, somebody comes and helps us out. Uh, so we take a lot of things for granted and we have to plan for that. Um, our budgets need to be turned in the preliminary budgets in August, early August. So in some cases we're, we're trying to project uh, some of these expenses and revenues out about 18 months um, when in preparation of these budgets. The next uh, item we have on here is certifying special assessments and typically that's a fall endeavor. Now there's usually a combination of different items that we certify for special assessments. They're either nuisance assessments where somebody doesn't mow their grass or shovel their sidewalks or take care of their house and the city goes out and does that service for them and assesses it to the taxes. So we process those charges and certify them to the county and they get included on uh, the property owner's uh, tax bill for the coming year. And we also have other things, and the most recent one that we have is their downtown project, where a portion of that project was paid for um, by assessments to the property taxes for those property owners. So they had to pay for some of those uh, improvements that benefited their property. It's a little bit of a cumber cumbersome process, and it's, most of you were here and probably participated in that process. Uh, but there's always a lot of questions, how do we uh, divide up the benefit to the properties? Is it front footage? Is it, you know, some other mechanism? Uh, so there's always some discussion. Um, and sometimes it's a little more clear cut than other times. This is one thing that the city of Minot does not do a lot of. Um, in our current tools that we have in our arsenal to um, accomplish this don't work very well. So it's a very manual process and time consuming. Once the specials are, are certified to the county, they go on the tax rolls, but we also still have to deal with collecting those. So if someone comes in and says, I wanna pay off my <coughs> special assessment um, before it's due, we still have to be able to calculate the interest and, and come up with a payoff to pay those off and communicate that back to the county as well. 
The next thing we have typically in the fall time frame is bond sales. Now last year we started down the road of doing a bond sale and we came uh, across some information from our financial advisor um, that we're a little bit disappointed in, in the terms and some of the requirements for the bond. It was a relatively small issuance, so we scrapped that project. Um, but this is something that is going to be very common in the years coming forward with the big projects such as the flood control project. Um, there's no way that we can fund that out of pocket uh, the way it's currently envisioned uh, without doing some type of bond sale. Now, we're looking at lots of different options. Uh, as you all know, in the last legislative session, we lobbied or encouraged um, our legislators to help us out with um, some creative financing from the state of North Dakota, and that didn't pan out. But uh, we haven't been sitting on our hands. We've been working on other options, uh, other programs, um, you know, whatever we can do to come up with different ideas uh, not only to see this project through to completion, but to minimize the cost uh, to the citizens of the, the city and the region for that matter. Look at that, we're already back to year end again. The time flies, right? So now we're in that November, December time frame again. Uh, we're just not sitting back and uh, deer hunting or whatever else we do in the fall. Uh, we're already getting ready for the end of the year. And part of that is doing things like, uh, you know, enforcing budget restrictions because we're getting down to the tail end of the year sometimes. That means that maybe our guess wasn't quite as good as we thought it was and maybe we spent the money that we had allocated for certain accounts. So we have to, you know, really monitor that. Uh, part of that process uh, when we get right at the end of the year is uh, calculating salary accruals and those types of things for expenses that are yet to be paid, but we know that we have to include them in uh, that year's business so that we know exactly what we have to work with. And again, this is a, a portion of our, our current tools that's a little bit lacking uh, that we're really looking forward to uh, improving in the future. Now you think there's a whole year gone by in just a matter of what, five, six minutes? <laughs> that's pretty efficient, right? All right, there's a little bit more to it. And this is some of the other things. And originally when we uh, were talking about doing this time frame, and we envisioned a circle graph with some of these big components in there. And then we wanted to go back and throw, oh, that's right. Every two weeks we have to do payroll and payroll tax deposits. Every two weeks we have to cut checks for payables. You know what? Every month we have reports that we have to do. We have to do quarterly payroll tax reports, quarterly financial reports. Um, you know, we have all the other process. We have the city council meetings to prepare for budget amendments. Uh, contract negotiations. Uh, we had a couple examples, or at least one example on tonight's meeting. We've had uh, negotiations. We were very involved in the FBO contract at the airport, um, some of these different things. And again, it's, it's to look out for the financial health of the city. So we want to make sure that we are upfront with those contracts and negotiate the best deal that we can for the city, but uh, we still accomplish the intended result at the end of the day. Some of the other things that we handle that are sometimes the left off the radar screen. We do utility billing downstairs, um, insurance claims for property uh, damage throughout the city. We participate or help with rate studies. We manage the pension, um, you know, preparation of the documents, the reporting that goes along with that. We sell parking passes in the utility billing office downstairs, process checks, and then the grant reporting and management. A lot of that flows through our office as well. Lots of real exciting stuff. <laughs> the one thing I am really excited about is a couple of the large projects that we have coming up in the near future. Um, and it's been a lot of work and it's going to be a lot of work to get this system off the ground. And that's our uh, ERP project and it it's, goes hand in hand with uh, uh, Lance's asset management projects. Um, some of the goals that we help hope to achieve with these are, you know, just to modernize and improve our business processes. And we've had that discussion a lot. Um, you know, some of the things, uh, the reason why we do the things we do is because the tools that we have are very cumbersome. They don't, they're not modern. They don't have the, the ability for us to change things on the fly. We have to um, make our processes fit into what we have um, to come up with the end product. So it, sometimes it's out of necessity and not uh, by design. Um, we want to improve consistency and transparency. 
you know, we can envision a day where, you know, anybody can, or department heads can click on a graph and it'll give you the detail in real time, what's there, what's spent, what's left of their budget. If they have something in the pipeline with the purchase order that hasn't been fulfilled yet, what's already encumbered, um, we should have that information in, in real time or near real time. And that's not the way it works today. So we'll give them better tools to help manage their departments and hopefully gain some efficiency. Um, improved reporting, uh, the comprehensive annual financial report, it's 200 pages worth of a lot of data and discussion and things like that, that right now today is compiled in a spreadsheet uh, from numerous sources and it's, it's tedious. Um, they kind of pass that around the finance department or take turns being responsible for it because it's very time consuming and, and it's a hassle. Um, so we hope to have improved reporting tools um, on dem demand user re reports where we can you know, slice and dice this data and filter it and come up with some meaningful information that we can uh, present uh, to be more efficient. You know, there's some of this stuff, uh, the ingenious thing about computers is they're based on logic. So if we have rules or things that are logic based, there's things that the computer can do for us. So if we enter it in there and send it through, the computer can say, you know, is rule A met, yes or no, and it can direct the traffic accordingly. So that's something that we uh, think is definitely going to make us more efficient in the, the future. Right now, a lot of our stuff is done on paper where we send paper all around the city for approvals. We still keep track of time and attendance on paper. Um, and it all comes through on paper to do payroll every two weeks. So, and that's just more redundant data entry, um, you know, the approval process. So there's a lot of efficiencies that we can gain. Uh, one of the big things here, give managers the tools to manage more efficiently. There's, there's no reason why for some of this information, they should have to call me or some of the staff or, or direct somebody to help them look it up or look it up themselves if they're more proficient with our system. Um, I still struggle getting information out of our legacy system because you have to know a series of characters to send the output to the correct printer. It's, it's not you know, uh, user friendly at all. So we'll get back into the 21st century here hopefully. And at the end of the day, we wanna improve service. We wanna improve service for our internal customers, uh, for the general public and our external customers as well. We want them to have a good experience when they're dealing with the city. We wanna be modern and be able to do some of these things and not be quite so stringent in how we go about things. Um, so hopefully at the end of the day, that will be uh, one of the outcomes from this project. I just wanted to give you a, the next, this is just a screenshot of what our finance system looks like today. This is one of the main, the menus. You don't click on anything, you enter the number and you go through it. And for our staff that has been here for a while, they're very fast at doing this. They don't even look. They just know the next screen's coming up and they're gonna click seven in or click one and, and move on. So it, it's second nature. But if you have any staff turnover, it's definitely a learning curve to get those people up to speed. So it takes some time. It's just not intuitive. And we have people coming out of college. They're used to a point and click environment. It's been that way for a long time and I'm getting old, but um, you know, they still had mouse, mice and point and click when I was in college. So, all right, we like to have a little fun in finance. So this is something we just want to give you the cast of characters. So we do like to have a little fun 
And hopefully we have a lot of good things coming up in the future. Um, we look forward to looking at new ways to, to make things a lot better. I know we have a lot of things in the works with updating some city ordinances, implementing a, a more robust purchasing uh, program. We have a number of things in the works and, and hopefully we can not only become more efficient, uh, alleviate some of the, the process, um, you know, just at the end of the day, be an overall improvement to how we do business. And, you know, I know that there's going to be some learning curves and some pain um, in the short term, but I think the long term potential is there and, and hopefully that's going to be a, a trade off that's going to be well worth it. So with that, I'd like to wrap up and stand for any questions that any of you may have. Any questions? Alderman Pittner. No questions. Uh, th thank you, Mayor Olson. Um, no questions, just comments. Um, Dave, thanks for all that you do and to your staff for all that you do. Um, I've had requests to uh, Finance Director Lakefield, and I've gotten response with the information very promptly, whether it be questions that I'm asked from a citizen that I don't know an answer to or whether it be during a legislative session and we need information on, on how dollars are spent or whatever it might be. Um, again, the promptness and the attention to detail that you guys and your department display, I, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Alderman Walski. Mary Olson, thank you. Mr. Lakefield, I appreciate the presentation. I, uh, I think these, as we've been doing these now on a, you know, for several months at least, I think they're valuable, in particular for the public that are paying attention. So I, I know there's a lot of work that goes into them, but I think they're valuable. Um, with regards to uh, finance, there are uh, a couple things. Um, with the, enter the, the new enterprise uh, software, um, I know this is going to be an ongoing process for quite a while, but what does our finish line look like in terms of the date where, where you guys have a pretty good handle on this and we're ready to sort of let go of, of the past and, and jump forward with the new stuff? Madam Mayor and Alderman Wolski, um, that's a little bit of a loaded question because we're still just beginning uh, the negotiation phase of negotiating the contract, but um, you know some of the conversations we've had with uh, different vendors and the presumed timeline and we've built in some contingency along the way to uh, we, we've discussed some of the best practices year end you know the big bang theory of introducing everything all at one time and some of the the downside of, of some of those approaches and right now it looks like we would go live with hr payroll finance uh, mid-year of 2020 so may june july time frame um, and then start adding on modules after that um, Lance's uh, proposals for um, the asset management, permitting, um, land use components are, are just coming due here in June. So there could be a possibility, uh, well, there is a possibility. It's, in all reality, those, uh, some of those modules are going to um, integrate and, and coincide with some of the implementation that we have on the finance and HR side. So some of this will depend on what vendor is selected for those other modules. If we end up with you know, uh, the same vendor or one that uh, very closely integrates or that could speed up our time frame a little bit. But it will be a series of years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have utility billing and some of the other modules that are a little bit down the road yet. Okay. I also continue just, uh, I appreciate hearing that and sort of setting the stage or the expectation for, for how this comes online. Um, you, there are a, a number of resources with the, the state that I take a look at on a regular basis as well as with the city. Uh, the, the page that you maintain that, that keeps us up to date on the monthly uh, sales tax revenue is something I look at on a, on a monthly basis to keep, keeps going, keep up to speed with, with where we're at. Um, as a part of the enterprise software, are we going to be able to get some uh, some added tools, some real-time real tools that help sort of uh, tell some of the financial stories through through these methods that we're using right now? Is that part of what we're going to get out of this? Um, Ms. Mayor Alderman Wolski, that is the vision right now. And right now, we really don't know exactly what that finished product will look like. Um, but for example, uh, a lot of that data that we distribute today uh, resides in spreadsheets. So we manually go and upload that to the, the website every month. Um, it's not something that's linked automatically. Um, so it's a, a bit of a manual process. So we get the information from the state. Uh, Maryland updates the spreadsheet. We make sure the graph is updated. You know, we send it out and, and make it available. So part of this process is, you know, to have those tools to uh, face some of that information forward. 
where it's interactive. So you may have a graph that shows, you know, the revenue to date from all sources in the city. And you can drill down on that and maybe look at it by types of revenue or departments or, you know, where that came from, how much is tax revenue. So having some ability to be able to access that information as self-service. Now, how much of that we'll be able to put out there um, because we have to have limits on uh, what everyone can see. But that is the vision that a lot of that will be out there and, and be a lot more interactive and graphical in nature so it's a lot easier to understand. I, I'm, I'm excited about where we're headed for with some of the stuff. And Mayor, one more follow-up here. But um, as a part of the annual budget process, Dave, uh, the, the one thing that I have continued to, to, to look for a little bit is information on the spend. Uh, and, and in terms of how we ended up the, the last calendar year versus all of those items that we budgeted, um, is there any way to, to get that information to us in a manner that is, uh, doesn't add an entire new list of activities to your guys' monthly process, which is already pretty significant? Um, or, or how and where do I get that and, and what are your thoughts? Madam Mayor Alderman Wolski, that information is available in the, the monthly reports on the website. But the printouts, and I have them in my office, you can stop in any time. It's about the size of an encyclopedia. Um, and it's a little bit cumbersome to, to work through it. Um, and it, it's not real intuitive. Um, and I can definitely help you look through that um, and process some of that information. But that's one of the goals that we look to improve at in the future is it should be easy, and our managers should have readily access, ready, readily uh, be able to access that information too. Um, and council members should be able to, to look at that, again, in near real time or real time, uh, to click on something and be able to drill down and, and see some of those details without having to phone a friend or, mm -hmm. or uh, research that any further. Excellent. Okay. Alderman Street. Uh, thank you, Mayor Olson. Dave, for in advance of next month, just because Alderman Walski brought up the community facilities discussion, and I know our mayor uh, chairs or was the last to chair that community facilities meeting. Can you send us a little update of where we're at uh, as we move into the budget? We had this conversation just briefly the other day that I have a, I have a dollar amount in my head that I think that's in that account, but you have a better understanding of what's designated currently, what's kind of encumbered, and just give us a sense because the public has been asking that and I don't want to ask Mayor Olson to do any unnecessary work if we are, we've exhausted it basically, but I'm just not aware of it. So if you could provide that to us, that would be greatly appreciated. And I guess I'm wondering, why are we selling parking passes and not bus passes as well? Um, Madam Mayor and Alderman Strait, we, we do sell bus passes, but it's an automated vending machine up in the lobby of the auditorium. So, see, I do pay attention. I learn a few of these things along the way. So we do have an automated uh, mechanism to accomplish that. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that for uh, parking passes. So um, the, the folks down in the utility billing got tasked with that. Uh, they're forward-facing to the public. They have access to the credit card terminals, the ability to handle cash in a secure environment, access to the PCs, and uh, they've kind of taken that and run with it. They've done a fantastic job. Um, so it's, it's, you know, we continue to improve. Uh, don't get me wrong, but uh, uh, knock on wood, I think things are really smoothing out there, and, and we look forward to what we have in the future. Mayor, um, Mayor, I, I want to come back to the earlier agenda item, Dave, and I, I appreciate, um, I, I said it earlier, but uh, I find myself under a tremendous amount of pressure here within this job, and I, I try to do it to the best of my ability, and I, I, I appreciated you meeting with uh, Ms. Ulrichson and myself and uh, Mayor Olson and just kind of hashing it out, but also being upfront that there are issues within the process that can be approved upon as we move forward with kind of the new uh, guidelines out of the magic fund and I, I really appreciate you um, speaking to that and just being in the position where you're at because I, I have a great deal of respect for what you do um, but because of the pressure that we're under uh, um, sometimes we have to make these tough choices and bring it forward as well so thank you sir I just wanted you to know thank you 
Any further questions? Alderman Padragula. Yes, seems like everybody has questions tonight. Um, I have some comments and five specific questions. And I know the clock is ticking, but I think these are important things. Um, comment is, I'm very impressed with the presentation. I like the humor with everybody wearing dark glasses and stuff like that. And I think given the kind of work you do, you probably have to have some sense of humor. Um, second comment I'd make would be that this, the, the kind of sophistication I'm seeing here, the kinds of processes, the kinds of plans, um, and the kind of very positive, open attitude toward, toward aldermen, toward citizens, other city staff, and particularly managers, is very refreshing. From my perspective, having been on the council on and off since 1998, this is remarkable, this is wonderful. Um, I, I, I really almost can't say enough about the change, the positive change I'm seeing. So I want to very strongly reinforce that and give it that historical perspective. Now, I do have five quick questions. Um, about how many staff do you have? I believe it's around 17 in the finance department, the, utility billing, and then we have the IT staff as well that uh, how many report there? to finance director. How many there? Uh, I believe there's five or six. Okay, thank you. Now, the second question is, um, how long and I know computer systems change and our expectations change and how we interface with them affects everything. Um, about how long will it take to take to catch up, you think, with our processes and systems, the things you're talking about improving here? How long do you think it'll take us to get to where we really need to be? Um, Ms. Mayor and Alderman Padragula, um, again, that's going to be a, a series of, of incremental steps along the way. Um, you know, we've been on the current system since the sometime in the 90s, um, so it's been here for a long time. And when we we're going through this process, we had over a thousand spreadsheets that we have devised and maintained to accommodate, uh, you know, problems or, or weaknesses in the process in the current system. Now, I'm not going to blame all of that on the software itself. Some of that was probably an implementation problem and things have just never been changed. But this will be something that once we go live, we're not just going to sign off on the developers and the contractors and say we're done and end it there. It'll be an evolution over, over time. Um, I'm not going to tell you that next year we're gonna go live with this, the first phases, and we're gonna solve all of the problems right out of the gate because that's uh, going to be misleading. You know, there are going to be things that we are going to have to wait on to implement at a later time. We're just not going to be able to make that drastic of a change all in one step. Can you give me at least a rough order of magnitude, hopefully it, positive estimate? Are we talking about months, years, many years? Uh, Alderman Padragula, I would say it will be several years. Thank you. Uh, you I, know, we're looking at the first phases going live mid-year next year and subsequent modules after that. Um, so we will have a series of steps we'll have to go through just to get this software up and running as it was originally designed, and then we can start making improvements to it. And I understand that it will be an iterative process, um, an interactive process too. Final question is, um, again, you're, what I see you doing is outlining again a process of making us much more sophisticated, much more business-like, much more proactive, much more transparent, much more business-like in a sense. Um, and that's remarkably good for me. But are there any other issues or problems or things coming up in the future that we can foresee that the council needs to be aware of in terms of this, this back room, back office, so to speak, of the city? Are there things, you know, two years, five years down the road, 10 years maybe, that we need to be aware of? I mean, you've given us a sense that what you're doing now, the, the important work you're doing is gonna take some years. But are there any other things besides what you've mentioned, besides the system, that, that you see coming up that we need to know about? Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Alderman Padragula, again, it's, it's a series of, of improvements. You know, a lot of these things are already being worked on uh, in today's environment, you know, trying to be a little bit more proactive with some of these agreements up front instead of uh, when they go into litigation and trying to unwind um, the agreements uh, later uh, in the life cycle of these things. So trying to be a little more proactive, more forward-looking um, down the road, uh, you know, a little bit better planning. We're looking at different uh, financing vehicles to level out some of these costs, whether that's lease agreements or different types of financing vehicles that we traditionally haven't done in the past. Um, and I'm not saying that that's the right uh, 
solution in every case, but we have to at least explore those options and see what makes sense to the city. Um, so it, it will be an ongoing process. One of the things that we're discussing and we're trying to get the RFQ done now is to hire a consultant to help us in this process on the front side, someone that has experience, uh, you know, um, migrating data from the existing software that we have to the software that we're going to, to help us with this change management process, you know, you know, best uh, of read characteristics and, you know, a lot of this uh, software stuff, again, it's all logic. Um, you have to get it set up correctly on the front end to be able to access that data later on. So it's very crucial that we make sure that we go down the right path early on and, um, you know, it's, it's going to cost us a little bit of money uh, up front, um, but I think that, uh, you know, we'll, that will pay dividends uh, later on in the life cycle of this software. And if we have this software for as long as we had the current software, that investment up front uh, definitely will be a lot better than trying to fix issues later on down the road. Thank you very much. I'm very enthused and very pleased about what I'm hearing. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Join us again. <laughs> um, that moves us into item number nine, which is the liaison reports. Um, we've been going that direction a lot, so we're going to start over here, Alderman Pajagula. All of the committees I've been tasked with uh, liaising with uh, either have not met or have stopped meeting, um, so I basically have nothing to report. All right, Alderman Strait. Uh, Mayor Olson, I guess um, uh, I, I'm at a loss. Uh, I sit on Visaminot. I think there's some unique and interesting things happening there, obviously. Um, I think there's hopefully going to be some discussions coming down the road of uh, within the budget. There's some challenges, uh, sponsorship issues, possibly with Hoosfest. Um, and uh, I think as uh, our current mayor and uh, our city manager are uh, traveling abroad. Um, I, I think that we have to keep in mind that Hoosfest stepped up to uh, help get those folks there. They recognize the importance of it, which I, I recognize as well. And I hope that we can figure out some way to possibly reciprocate and help Hoosfest back out. I know that's a challenge, but that's a thought. All right. Thank you. Um, I have. I thought I was attending my last library board meeting, but with some scheduling changes, I'm able to attend two more actually before my term is up. Um, I sat in on the first Magic Fund contract committee and anticipate some more coming down the pike. Um, I did represent the mayor at the Salute to Seniors last week and has been mentioned numerous times this evening. I am the acting mayor and it is our belief, we don't know it for certain, but it is our belief that I am the first woman in my net's history to have chaired a city council meeting. So thank you for being here tonight with us. Um, Alderman Walski. Mayor Olson, thank you. Uh, Planning and Zoning Steering Committee. Uh, this is a, a, an item for a consultant that was before us over the last few months. Um, that work is ongoing and I think everybody's kind of starting to get a handle on the process. Mr. Billingsley's now joined us for, for three or four of those meetings or, or at least probably two or three. but. Um, so I, I think the, the timing, the schedule, uh, how everybody's going to get through this process is becoming clearer. Um, I, the, the discussions are deep. We had a couple items on our agenda tonight related to second readings for turf and for mm -hmm. downtown signs. Um, Renaissance Zone, uh, our meeting will be coming up here uh, in a week or so, but obviously uh, last meeting we had the removal of blocks. Uh, I anticipate uh, a quick turnaround probably on consideration of which blocks to add in. Uh, obviously uh, some of the Trinity sites have been contemplated, North Broadway, uh, a revision of, of where we put our one statutory uh, island. Uh, so these are some some of the conversations that are in the works, I think, for the Renaissance Zone, as well as the ongoing work on the larger guiding document there, the development plan. Uh, and then county planning, uh, you may have caught in the news a little bit over this weekend, uh, a, a, an issue that has been in front of the county planning for several years now is the the right-of-way dedication required uh, during a platting process. Um, uh, Mr. Pittner was there. Uh, were you there? You were not there. Uh, <laughs> This was a couple nights ago. So. <laughs> Were you there? It was, it was five, five meetings ago, I guess. So it's it's been it's gotten blurry, um, but uh, we, the planning commission, have uh, asked uh, the county staff to take another look at the right of way 
issue to bring us back what's hopefully maybe a middle road or a middle road or a compromise plan uh, to, to help get the county through that process over the next few years. We're seeing an enormous number of variances. Uh, I would say at least one a month regarding that particular ordinance. And so uh, the hope is that we can we can push a, a revision to that ordinance forward. So, Alderman Pittner. Thank you, Mayor Olson. Um, obviously, Alderman, Alderman Wolski covered the uh, Ward County Planning and Zoning Commission uh, uh, meeting. Um, so no news there. I don't have another committee, but if I read the tea leaves correctly, I will be relieving you of your duty on the uh, library committee so, so I'll have more uh, information to share maybe at the at the next one all right all right item number 10 is miscellaneous and discussion items is there anything that we have not discussed this evening that needs to be discussed now mayor Olson yes I have one item uh, and based on a comment I got just today uh, specifically for uh, Jason and Dan and our public works department uh, at a citizen reach out who uh, seems to be sort of I think landing on the, the wrong side of, a, uh, of an unlucky pattern, which is uh, street sweeping seems to be continuously aligning with their garbage day. And so when the street sweeper comes down the street, it always has to go around the garbage cans, and as a result, the streets never clean. clean. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I can only imagine the challenge in trying to coordinate that particular piece of logistics. Uh, I, I would imagine it to be immense, but obviously, uh, uh, we have folks who want clean streets and, and they keep getting unlucky so if there's any way to figure that out let's let's try anything else if not I would entertain a motion to adjourn motion to adjourn second we are adjourned <laughs>